everyone, welcome to the Knights of Last Call. My name is Derek Melinda. Welcome back to a super secret Sunday stream. Not a system stream. A lot of times on these Sunday streams, we do um, first looks or we do system deep dives, but not today. Uh, today, I did a poll because uh, I kind of unexpectedly I figured out that, uh, you know, we uh, have off tomorrow. It's President's Day. My company has off. It's kind of sick, actually. I do have to work because uh, <laughs> I got dropped with the project, but I don't have to like be like I'm going to be working, but I'm not at work, if that makes any sense. In other words, like I don't have to worry about meetings or responding to emails. So, you know, it's a little bit more of a relaxed night. And so that's why uh, we're going to be here. Um, so, yeah, uh, tonight I asked the, the patrons uh, what we should talk about on this kind of last minute Sunday stream and a topic which we have discussed at length uh, on this stream before, but it also it comes up a lot on our Nights of Last Call uh, Discord, and I think it's an important thing to talk about because I think it's important to understand some of the un, the nuances and the differences. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, I, I myself I think I think this is actually a major area where I struggle with, and I, and I'll talk. I mean, some of this will just be anecdotes, uh, stories from me um, a, about why this is something that I struggle with, and that is. The difference, if we can understand so conceptually, is what is what is fun and what is interesting and how are they connected and how are they different and in what ways does one cannibalize the other, but also in which ways does one heuristically support the other? And, you know, are there RPGs that we play uh, or that we know that sort of represent a better understanding of this spectrum, of this continuum. And and is that necessarily a good thing, a bad thing? And of course, one thing that we'll definitely get into is this idea of, um, you know, what is, what is the objective versus subjective reality of these concepts anyways? I mean, it should go without saying that is what is fun for one person may not be fun for another. And what is interesting for one person may not be um, interesting to another. But I do think that there are some objective qualities that we can look at. And maybe we can try to sort of understand where, uh, you know, how this all shakes out and where where we're going with this. And again, a lot, some of it will just be anecdotes, things that I've, uh, I myself uh, have found myself struggling with over the, you know, many years, and we can get into it. Uh, so hello, 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 everybody. Hello to you, Mr. Pepper. Good to see you. What is up, Pumpkin? Awesome to see you as well. GM Scott is here, having just gotten back from a re-release Dune viewing, which is very awesome. The sleeper must awaken. Kyle is here. Hello. Hello, sir. Uh, Boothby's not at the gym. Welcome, Boothby. Beowulf's trying to keep it locked down on a mobile internet. <laughs> Good luck, Beowulf. Albastine. Hello, everyone. Hello to you. Hello to Luke. And uh, yeah, Boothby, I don't know where we're going to go tonight either, um, you know, but this is sort of the, the, the framework that we will work off of. Um, TSL says, there's been so much usual breakdown content of do D&D good that I've really been missing how to ignore the game uh, and have fun instead. And I think actually TSL, in that sort of uh, quick one sentence, is really striking at the heart of the matter. Uh, and sort of my internal existential dilemma with fun and interesting. Um, because it's sort of a catch-22. The purpose of the game is for you to have fun. But if you're ignoring the game to have fun, what are you doing? And... Uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of like, it, it's just a very strange concept to me. And you might say, well, yeah, but we're having fun. Everybody's having fun. That's great. But what, there, there's something you're paying. There is a cost there. And I don't know what it is. And I think we're too cavalier. I think we give that away too easily. We got GM Scott GM tipping. GM Scott tip $3. The new version of June is good but it just doesn't have those power cords of the 1984 version. 
I, yeah, I agree. I mean, although I am really looking forward to Dune Part 2. So uh, thank you, GM Scott. Um, by the way, uh, we have a tip goal. Uh, uh, it's really more of a super chat goal, a tip goal. If you tip a super chat, you let me know where you want to go at, uh, or where you want your money thrown. I can always adjust it here on the uh, on the back end side of things. Um, technically, super chat's up top. Uh, tips are in the bottom. You know, but one thing that we've been sort of talking about and thinking about, I, I get a lot of comments. You know, you you know this channel. Uh, we talk, you know, we, we, we just covered Hackmaster, you know, which is not only a completely insane game, but it's also like 10 years old, uh, over the, over 10 years old, uh, you know, Ryutama, just, you know, strike, you know, we, we cover a lot of very small press games, but I do get a lot of comments in, uh, in the YouTube uh, especially for people who are watching some of our newer videos, but also people who are watching some of our older videos. And they go, you know, I'd really love to know what Derek and Smith and Bob and the Knights, you know, what they make of this sort of big situation that's happening here, especially in 2024 and into 2025. We've got Pathfinder 2nd Edition remastered finishing. We've got D&D 5E.5 or whatever they're calling it coming out and some of these other major tentpole releases from some other very large companies um, that are, you know, kind of really trying to dig into the RPG space. And, you know, a lot of people want to know what, what we think of all of that. And typically I will admit we have sort of shied away from that because other channels, you know, have do it, do it more often. Uh, you know, they, they, there's no, there's no dearth of, of coverage for those type of ideas, but nonetheless, people do still want to know what we think. Um, and by and large, especially like when it comes to like D&D 5th edition, I've mostly ignored it. Um, I don't know the edition that well. And so the Unearthed Arcana releases don't really mean much to me. I don't really quite understand the play test itself uh, because I don't really understand the game all that well. Uh, it's it's kind of crazy to say, but it is true. Uh, anyways, so if you throw a super chatter tip our way this uh, tonight, if you want to go ahead and throw where you would like your support to go, this isn't like a hard and fast rule. I, I'm just sort of, you know, letting you all vote uh, with your dollars and your super chats and your tips as you get a little bit of extra uh, press and special time. Thanks for uh, for supporting the channel. And, you know, we'll see what you think of it. Uh, anyways. What up, Chase? Thanks, Chase. Chase tipped $5. Thanks for providing me entertainment while I do my taxes. Keep the small indie stuff coming. Oh, Chase, thank you, buddy. Uh, appreciate it. You know, I gotta, I gotta do my taxes itself. Actually, I've got several tax things going on this year. Number one, uh, RETA, which stands for Regional Income Tax Authority, which is a conglomerate that does all of the local cities' income taxes. They sent me a thing because they said, "Hey, you didn't pay us anything." in uh in 2019 or 2020 and of course the reason is because i wasn't working um and i was starting this youtube channel and i had a business that was making no money um and so my 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 income was negative for two years um and so i didn't have to file with them because my income was negative and then so that's that's tax fun thing number one and then tax fun thing number two is thanks to all of you horrible people out there last year night to last call actually did make money um, and so, uh, you know, I paid out our, our landlords and I paid out my forge and foundry subscriptions and all this other stuff. Uh, but when I, and I paid out, I paid out my employees, I played out my guest stars. Um, but when all was said and done, there was money left over. And so I do have to like go through the process of filing all of this crap and, you know, writing down all of this, like, you know, <laughs> my expenses and, where I made my money and all this other stuff. So this year's taxes is going to be, and, and you know what, honestly, if this is going to keep happening, I'm probably just going to have to hire an accountant to do it just because it is a little complicated. And, but the main takeaway folks <laughs> is that um, there's no withholding <laughs> when YouTube or uh, Patreon gives you your money, which means I basically did not pay any taxes uh, at all on last year because I didn't, I didn't you know. I didn't even know what my income was going to be. It changes every single month. Um, but so, so, you know, I may have to pay, I may have to pay a, a decent chunk, you know, more than I would like to pay, but then that, that's, them's the breaks. Uh, that's how it works in a democratized and civilized society. We, we help each other and we pay for each other. Um, but thank you for that support. Uh, Jackal, what is up? KC shouting out the super secret Sunday stream. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, open world addict. 
says, yay. I'm here before the stream starts, but then adds there's nothing else to watch. I, I I think I feel that's good. Or are you just saying that this is your last effort? That's our, our last ditch, last ditch uh, um, choice. It's fine. Uh, should we start with a fun or an interesting poll? You know what, London? That sounds pretty good. Let's go for that. Let's see if we can get this here. Okay. What is more important to you in an RPG game fun or interesting all right the poll is up go ahead and get your vote in there now what does this mean to you i mean who knows i mean this that's what we're going to kind of get into um but i do i do think that there's some there's some there's some deep rooted seated issues here uh that we kind of need to work for um <laughs> Uh, well, that's good. Doom scrolling leading to this. That's, that's a, that's a complete win, Casey. That's how I see it anyways. Um, <laughs> are we talking about fun systems like Marvel and Ryutama? Uh, we could talk about those. Um, I would say that Ryutama definitely falls into the, in my personal opinion, fun, but not interesting, but then not being interesting can make it not fun. That that's where like the paradox comes in and we, and we can talk about this. Um, I hope I don't need a tip or super chat to be part of the conversation because I can't afford any of that stuff. Nope, you do not. You know, you get a cool little shout out and, you know, your name comes up, but there's no reason that you need to do that in order to be joined by another conversation. Um, Dan says, I've heard one commentator say that you should not and cannot design a game to be fun. Dan, uh, was that me? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> because I say that all the time. I, I say that creating a des game design goal of my game should be fun is I think a flawed approach to creating a game. Um, I think that because that's sort of a, a truism, you know, that's like saying that my goal in creating food is something that tastes good. Well, yeah, I, I would hope, I would imagine that you do, but you know, I think that you can end up making some very significant uh, flaws in your design if you try to please everybody. And a lot of this conversation goes back to the Mark Rosewater 20, uh, lessons in 20 years where he talked about fun and interesting. And for anybody who missed that channel, a uh, stream where we went over Mark Rosewater's 20 lessons, he basically says, um, don't, you know, a lot of times when game designers are working on something uh, and they see a problem or they see an area of opportunity, they end up uh, making the game more interesting, but not necessarily more fun. And, you know, don't confuse interesting with fun. Just because something is an interesting choice or an interesting decision or an interesting mechanic does not necessarily mean it is a fun mechanic. Um, so that is something I think that is kind of at the heart of this. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, see, like this one. <laughs> uh, always great to have you here quick and dirty. Nice to, nice to have you. Um, Let's see here. Now, fun and interesting are both subjective. Yes. However, I do think that there are objective qualities and there is a sort of understanding the relationship between the two of them that really helps. Um, I think that can help people better understand what, what it is that they like about these games. You know, <laughs> uh, that's one way to put it. Philosophical highbrow. The other way to put it is completely mind-numbing pedantry but you know it's it's fine it's all good first timer here for dm randall hello dm randall welcome 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 good to have you here let's see youtube is being an ass to me lots of skips and freezes you know a lot of people have been saying lately that they have been having problems with our streams but i've also heard other youtubers talking about it too what up, London? London tipped five dollars. Indie vote until I see a great game that takes from Monster Hearts, Blades, <laughs> and Apocalypse World. If only there was such a game. Uh, a game that takes from Blades, Monster Heart, and Apocalypse World. I mean, there's there's a number of those games. Or, or are you trying to be rhetorical? Uh, but thank you, London, for supporting that. Um, squirrel, Her squirrel, squirrel, squirrel hermit. This is a good topic. $2. Well, thank you, Squirrel Hermit. I appreciate the uh, 
appreciate the support. Appreciate that you like it. Um, so uh, I'm glad somebody likes it. <laughs> um, so what I was going to say is that for people who uh, are on YouTube on Chrome, apparently, because remember Chrome owned by Google, Google owns YouTube. Um, Google, basically the, the what I understand is Chrome knows that you're using ad blockers or ad skips and it is passing that information to YouTube and the YouTube servers are throttling you. Um, and so they are trying to make your YouTube experience worse so that you will remove all your ad block software um, so that you can get ads. And this is true whether you're on premium or if you're not on premium. Um, but this is just a rumor that I've heard. A lot of people have been complaining to me, um, or I, a lot of people have been complaining about it in the YouTube sphere. And a lot of people are trying to figure out what the solution is. It could just be that YouTube, you know, sucks right now. So that is a possibility. Um, let's see here. Uh, I sorry, I missed some stuff here. Uh, a lot of, a lot of stream, stream coming on here. Uh, here's a question that comes to mind. What emotions are fun supposed to invoke? What emotions are interesting supposed to invoke? We're all striving for a certain feeling at the end of the day. I, I completely agree with you. But, I mean, I will say this, okay? Game designers. I'm talking about real game designers. People like Mark Rosewater. I have seen the design conversations. I have seen the commentary. I've seen the notes that they pass back to one another when they are designing something like a Magic the Gathering set. And let me tell you, uh, they talk about fun and interesting a lot, okay? The, you know, a lot of people say it's all subjective. Well, guess what? The leading game designers creating some of the most important and best games in the world don't agree. Video game designers don't agree. Magic the Gathering designers don't agree. They believe that fun and interesting are separate things, and they believe that they are connected things, and they believe that they can actually tune and twist and tweak mechanics to sort of tickle both of those elements. Um, and I think that that is really, really important. Um, now that doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, you know, people don't have individual experiences. We all do, but by and large, I mean, these are things that people, you know, put a lot of, put a, put a lot of faith in. Um, let's see here. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Nutramancer says, I like to, to not ignore the game. That's why I prefer to use a game whose rules actually work. Hey GM Scott tip $25. I love the coverage you guys give to small publishers. I have picked up quite a few RPGs with some great ideas in them which have influenced my gaming even if I haven't run them. Thank you, GM Scott. And I and I think that's important. I mean, GM Scott, that's true for me too, right? There's a lot of games out there that someone mentions to me, you know, especially people like Ben. I mean, uh, that no one really had picked up. Um, and you read it and I go, this is probably never going to hit my table but it makes me think about role-playing games differently. And every so often, Scott, you know, somebody comes back from Gen Con hyping up something like Dragon Bane, and before you know it, you have seven, I think, seven or eight different community games that are running, people starting up entire West Marches campaigns for play Dragon Bane, people taking Dragon Bane back to their home campaigns, um, you know. So I, I, I agree with you that, you know, there can be these sort of breakthrough moments where sometimes you just you're finding some little nugget, a little idea, or or just something that really you know resonates with you. On the other hand, sometimes you find something that completely changes the game, and you know leads you to uh, basically abandon whatever ideas you had about role playing games and pick up a new system. So I think I think you're I think there is a lot of value in that absolutely, and that's definitely one of the strong points of the Nice Last Call Patreon for sure. So thank you, Jim Scott. Um. So yeah, uh, it, 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 again, it's it's a question of um, you know going back to fun and interesting. Um, let me take a look here at the poll. <laughs> no, 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 Kyle, you have to pick one. Okay, you can't just you can't just pick you can't just pick uh, you can't pick both. It's a cop out. I'm gonna end the poll. All right. So fifty seven oh, fifty six percent of people said fun, and forty three percent of people said interesting interesting um so pretty close to tied we have 50 votes um but fun did get the the advantage if you will um and i think that makes sense i mean fundamentally at a certain level these are games 
and we are playing games, especially TTRPG games, um, because we want the entertainment. We want the release. We want the good times. We want the fun times, right? And so we, we, we are drawn to specifically games because they are fun. Now, there are obviously exceptions to this. And I think it's important to understand that uh, uh, maybe a, maybe a good example we've been talking about Dune is movies. Okay, when I say the word movie, most of the time people are probably thinking of fiction. You know, it might be a superhero film, it could be a shootout film, it could be a, a drama film, right? It could be an emotional romantic film or an emotional roller coaster type film. But you're thinking of a movie that, by and large, operates. Right? In your heart. I mean, obviously everything happens in your brain. But what I mean is it's about your emotions. It's about how you feel. Right? It's about how you, maybe you're afraid. Maybe you're, uh, 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 you know, sad. Maybe you're hyped. Right? But it's playing on your emotion. But there are uh, nonfiction movies. Right? There are documentaries. And documentaries are not necessarily supposed to be fun. I mean, don't get me wrong. Movies and storytelling almost always work better when you can appeal to someone's emotional uh, component as well. It's a great way to can win arguments and win debates is to make you know an appeal to, lo uh, uh, not just an appeal to logic, but an appeal to the pathos as well. But by and large, a documentary is supposed to be interesting. And whereas a, movie, like a traditional movie, is supposed to be sort of an emotional experience. A documentary often isn't an intellectual or a mental one. It's designed to get you to think differently. It's designed to educate you. It's designed to make you have to re-examine the way that you are viewing the world or your understanding of the world. So these are very, two very different goals. And obviously there are people who love documentaries. I happen to be one of them but I also really love learning. But does that mean that documentaries are fun? Is, is, is it right? Cause it's all subjective. No, I would never say a documentary is fun. That doesn't mean I don't enjoy it. Okay. So I think there's a, a conflation between if something's enjoyable, it must be fun, right? Well, no, not necessarily. Something could be really enjoyable, even if it's not fun. And to me, that is, you know, I mean, there are people out there who really love to learn, who love to sit down with a book and learn a new skill or learn a thing, or even like, you know, I don't know, back in college or whatever like that, learning a new thing. There are people who really enjoy that. Um, I enjoy learning new skills. I mean, that's one of the reasons why a couple of years ago I had never used a power saw. And now I make furniture because I was interested in that and I liked learning new skills and hobbies. That wasn't, I wasn't say it was fun, Right. The, the, the purpose of that event wasn't to, you know, have this like fun, emotional roller coaster. It was to challenge myself. Um, and so I think that that, that, and, and where, where I get where, where, you know, kind of, and again, I'm, I'm apologize if I miss everybody's chat. You guys are really chatting, chatting it up. I will try to, again, th this is one of the reasons why if you do a tip or super chat, I can usually more focus on your chats. Um, but, uh, I, I will try to sort of catch up. Um, where I struggle with is, in my experience, I have always sort of leaned, in my mind, I, more cerebral towards interesting things. And, and, and I can tell this because when I play games that I consider to be fun, but not interesting, okay, I get bored. I, I'm, cl I'm clearly having a fun time, but I get bored. And, and, and a great example of this is party games. This isn't just RPGs. Uh, we've often talked about my hatred for Mario party here. Um, but also, you know, your traditional party games that get pulled out at, you know, uh, board games that get pulled out at parties. Um, you know, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of silly ones that I don't really particularly love that people love. Um, uh, what is it? No. Nah. What's the deck? What's what's the game called with all the cards and the nouns and the verbs and you have to guess that I what, against uh, cards against humanity, okay? Cards against humanity. 
I hate that game. I hate it. You know, is it fun? Yeah. I mean, like, it's one of those things where I'll say, I hate that game. And then someone will sit down and will play it. And I'll laugh because somebody will inevitably use like, you know, I don't know, you know, handicapped, handicapped van or something as an answer. And it's like this horrible, like always sunny in Philadelphia level, grown, cringe, you know, kind of humor. And yeah, I'll laugh or whatever, or I'll go, oh my God, you know, and I'll chuckle or whatever. So it's like, oh, you're having fun. You must be enjoying this. No, not, not really. <laughs> JMH. JMH tipped fifteen dollars. Cards against humanity. Haters unite. Yeah, I, I've never been a, uh, uh, I've never been a yes. Um, uh, uh, apples to apples is another one. Um. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. All right. I'm getting stream notifications. We did drop some frames there. That one was on me. Mm. All right, hold on a sec here. All right. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to take a look at some of my. I'm gonna lower my bit rate a little bit. GM Scott tipped five dollars. I'm with JMH. Okay. All right, I uh, I lowered my bitstream quality a little bit. I don't know if I'm having problems on my end with my internet, but uh, maybe this will help. Um, all right. Uh. GM Scott with $5 also throwing in his support here. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, so uh, thank you, GM Scott. Uh, apparently, apparently I am not alone uh, in my, in my displeasure uh, or dislike for this game. Um, so uh, another a good example, of this is like werewolf. I don't, I don't, I don't like playing werewolf. I find that game to be boring and I find it to be uninteresting. Um, and, and so again, that is to me a game, you know, apples to apples, Mario Party against Cards Against Humanity, where it's designed to be fun, okay, but not necessarily interesting. And a lot of people like playing those games. Obviously, they're very popular. Um, and I think it comes down to the idea that a and it would, and and the paradox, the paradox of interesting games is, and, and I see this all the time, and I, it's actually one of the reasons why I don't like one-shots games for certain systems. Because I think the, again, remember, fun does not equal enjoyment. Enjoyment can come from a lot of different sources. There are games that are only enjoyable if you experience them over a long enough period of time where the game's complexity and the sort of puzzle that the game presents allow you to really grow to appreciate it. And a lot of times people will sit down and, you know, this is a game that I would call more interesting or more complex and people will sit down and they will play it and they'll get really frustrated with it. And they'll say, well, this game isn't particularly fun. I don't enjoy it. And they're not wrong. The game isn't fun. The game isn't trying to be fun. The game is trying to present an interesting, uh, you know, uh, 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 intellectual challenge, a mental challenge. It's trying to uh, uh, create a nuanced and complex set of interactions that as you sort of explore it, go deep, you will find this great appreciation. But. Why, why does Mark Rosewater say don't necessarily confuse make don't confuse fun with interesting? Because the fact of the matter is, most human beings, especially if you're designing games as a, uh, a way of making money, you get a lot further when you appeal to people's emotional state rather than their intellectual state. And we, you know, as as human beings, there are plenty of people 
who will enjoy a fun game enough to buy it and play it and put money into it. But there are a lot of people who bounce off of these games that aren't initially just like fun right out the boat. And maybe they would really enjoy the game if they put, you know, 5, 10, 20 hours into the game. But we live in a world where that kind of investment that people are, just don't have the time or they're not willing to make because there's always a, a new mobile game. There's always a new TV show coming down the pike and you don't have time for it. So it's on to the next one. Which one can get me my high? Which one can get me my fix tonight, today? And so interesting games have this problem where people bounce off of them because they never get to the part where they enjoy it. Because a lot of times games that are interesting are really fucking frustrating when you first play them. They're confusing, they're difficult to understand, and they're very, very, very obtuse. And in some ways, that complexity, that obtuseness is what makes them enjoyable because you're figuring out how all of these complex game mechanics interact with one another. But this also creates a problem because, you know, what, what game could I be describing right now? I don't know, maybe Pathfinder 2nd Edition. But this creates a problem, two big problems. The first problem is it creates a problem for the company. The problem for the company is, well, that's great. We've created an interesting game that has a lot of depth. People talk about that all the time, right? A game has a lot of depth. That's usually an example of an interesting game. But I've just said that this is a horrible way, right? This is a horrible way to get people to buy into your game. You want new people to come into your game. And if the game is really deep and depth and complex, you might get a lot of people who bounce off the game and decide that this isn't for them. And they go and play something else or they never get involved. They never get, they never buy into your game. They never buy into your ecosystem. And that's a problem. So it's a problem for the company because they're, they're like, their whole shtick is that we've got this really complex, interesting game. But now they have this kind of like, they're trying to, they're trying to play both sides. And they have to try to like, well, a lot of times what they'll end up doing is they might make uh, certain changes or certain, uh, you know, sort of certain surrenders, certain, you know, certain, they'll give, they'll give up on certain ideas in order to make the game more palatable, make the game more accessible, make the game more fun because that's going to increase the bottom line. Or they use a lot of fancy marketing and they try to tell people this game isn't that complex. This game isn't that, you know, complex, uh, you know, complicated. You could totally play it with a bunch of new people who've never played RPGs before. And in which case, oftentimes that's just a lie. And then people go and they pick up the game and they don't like it. So the second problem, that's the first problem. The second first problem is it creates a problem from the company because again, as Mark Rosewater said, fun games sell. Right. And don't get me wrong. If your game is just fun and it's not interesting, it may not have the longevity to keep people truly invested in your game. And so being interesting is important, too. But it also creates a problem. I'm talking about interesting games here, uh, you know, Pathfinder 2 and so many other games where it creates a problem with the players as well, because it can lead to this superiority complex. OK, some people have said that I am uh, guilty of this, where. Somebody invests the time into a game and they really enjoy it. And then other people, you know, come and say, oh, Pathfinder 2 is so horrible. You know, like it's so complicated. And I don't want to play it. And, and you dismiss them because you basically say, well, they just they didn't have the they didn't have the chops to take. You know, it, 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 this 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 game is uh, this game is not for kids. This game is for the more, uh, you know, advanced and intellectual gamer. And it can create a sort of weird you know, gatekeepy kind of experience where, you know, when a game is really, really obtuse, a lot, sometimes our enjoyment of the game comes from the fact that nobody else fucking understands it. There is a pride that comes with being on the inside of what it seems to be an elite group of the few. And the reason why I know that this is true is because, and I don't care what anybody says, this is what I believe, is this is kind of the, the basis of D and D when Dungeons and Dragons? I mean, Gary Gygax even says this, you know, in numerous articles and Dragon Magazine and in forums. You know, D and D was aimed at the time mostly at the sort of white suburban, you know, smart kid dork outcast, 
And the whole concept of the of the game was to create a a feeling of elitism in in the player who, you know, could truly master the game. And to be clear, mastery feels good. I think we can all agree that there, you know, there are difficult games. There are difficult, uh, you know, video games or whatever difficult tasks. And when you do well at them and you get good at them, it could be really enjoyable. But it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the game is accessible and that it can be easy to pick up. And that could be a real big problem for it. And so I think that that is something that, you know, these games for me, even I struggle with because let's take a look at a, like a more reasonable example. Okay. Um, and I did see somebody again, I know the chat's going by here. Beowulf says Luke crane games kind of come across that way to me. Beowulf. I don't think you're wrong. I don't think you're wrong. Now, Luke crane games appeal to people like me and Ben and I'm not saying that Ben and I are elitist gatekeeping fucks, but on the scale of everybody's invited to elitist gamekeeping fucks, I admit I am definitely a little bit more this way. I am. It's just my taste. I like these complex games and I like the game. Now, the difference is if somebody says, I don't want to fucking learn how to play that game. That thing is insanely stupidly complicated. I don't think less of them. That's the difference. Now, I, I can't speak for Smith or Ben or anybody else, but I don't necessarily think that that is a, a moral failing on their behalf. I, I will say what I do get a little upset about is when I see somebody who has that sort of morally superior stance, okay, because they're so proud of how they're so good at some, some game, but because they have no sense of perspective. They don't understand that that game's not even that complex. Okay, the, the, the thing that they have mastered, the thing that they have cracked the code on is Connect Four, right? It's, you know, maybe Othello. It's not chess. It's not Go. Okay, like, it's cool. Like, I'm glad that you have it, but, you know, slow your roll. On the other hand, if I met somebody who was like a true undisputed master of burning wheel, would I be impressed? Yes. Yes, I would. <laughs> um, so I, I get that, you know, um, I get that. <laughs> Dare, <laughs> Cole says they're calling out the 5e optimizer community. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I mean, 5e is, is a, is example of a game that is, <sighs> and again, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with having a game that isn't as complex. There's no doubt about it. And, and I think when you look at 5e and you look at what the people, you know, 5e to me has this classic problem where, you know, you've got too many people playing it. And so, and too many people play it in very different ways. And so how do you possibly create a role-playing system that can handle all of this? You can't, it's really, it's really tough. You know, and so 5e is stuck in a really tough position where they need to make their game accessible. But when people start playing a game for a long time and they're enjoying it and it's fun uh, for some people, they never go deeper than that. They are completely fine to show up at your house every, you know, once a week, twice a month, um, once a month for board game night and play apples to apples. OK, or play um, code names, which is a fine game. It's it's a party game. I can almost stand. But if, but then after a few weeks of doing this, somebody might go, hey, do we have any games that are more complex? Do we have any games that are more interesting, a little bit more in depth? I'm putting all this time into something. I, I feel like I kind of want to be rewarded for that. And I think that's the big thing that to me is the distinction between interesting and fun. Okay. Um, which is this, can you get better at this game? As human beings, one of the things that we like to do is compete. We like to compete with each other, but we also like to compete with ourselves. And I think that's why you see 5e and you see all of these people trying to optimize and they're trying to create all this homebrew content and they're trying to really expand the game because we want that. We want that feeling of improvement of, hey, I'm investing years of my life into this game. I, I, I'm hoping that there is something on the other side that, that I can invest my time into. 
And since the game, by and large, isn't competitive, right? Because if you're playing competitive chess or you're playing competitive Magic the Gathering or competitive video games, uh, you could turn around and you could say, uh, scoreboard, you know? I mean, yeah, I, I, I might want to get better, but there's a dis, there's like a clear delineation. I can look at what rank I'm at or what my, e, you know, um, what my ELO is. But with role-playing games, how do you, how do you know if you get, or if you're getting better? And I think a lot of times what ends up happening and, and, and I will throw some of my favorite games in the world under the bus here, not under the bus because it's not a bad thing. Powered by the apocalypse games are not necessarily interesting in their mechanics. I mean, there's some clever things there and they do some interesting things. I'm not going to say that that's completely, like, it's not a zero, but by and large, there's no real system mastery in PBTA games. There's a whole hell of a lot more than most people give it credit for, but most, by the most part, after you've played Powered by the Apocalypse for a number of sessions, uh, you, you've kind of got it all. You've kind of figured it out, you know? And so once that happens, you feel like, okay, we're playing and we're telling stories and I'm having fun, but I'm also getting bored and I'm also losing interest. So, the, 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 the interest level of a game is really important if you want to attract the kind of player and the kind of person who wants to invest in a game and invest in a hobby. If people just want to be surface level and then, then that's it, you know, I, I've known plenty of people. You, you all do not count because you're here and it's Sunday night. But you all have played with people in your games, probably not your game masters, although that's not unheard of too, where they show up for the game, they sit down, they have fun, they're not disrespectful, they know the rules, uh, you know, maybe they don't know all the rules, but you know, they're not even, they're, they're not, they don't lie about it, they have not thought of their character, they have not thought of the game, they have not read an article, they have not watched a YouTube video, they have not looked at the rule book, okay, they have, they don't own anything, they use someone's borrowed book or some sort of PDF that somebody sent them. Maybe they own like the player's handbook or the core book, but it's mostly a shelf's decorative space. They don't really look at it. And when the session is over, they look around at everybody and they had fun. They literally, they do mean that they had fun and then they leave and they completely don't think about the game for another week. It's just, and, and that doesn't mean that they are not enjoying that session, but if they are playing a system at that session that is not necessarily interesting, that doesn't have this ability to develop mastery and to uh, uh, learn and, and integrate with the system and uh, be rewarded for all of your repetitions. That won't matter to them because it doesn't. You know, that's not something that they're gonna bounce off of. It doesn't matter. Um, I did see we had a, we did have a member super chat. That is from our good friend Shadram. He says, how would you rate different games on the fun and interesting scale? Forbidden Lands, Blades in the Dark, 4E. Does interesting require higher complexity? Yeah, Shadram, let's get into that a little bit. Um, I did also, a, a, a friend of the stream here, uh, Roll for Combat, says, look who is streaming. How did the Friday night game go? Uh, Roll for Combat, I think it went really well. Um, we had a lot of fun time. Uh, we had a fun time. Uh, you know, we were playing Forbidden Lands. There are some things about the system, you know, uh, I mean, this is kind of also what caught, created the genesis of this uh, stream. Um, there are some elements of the Forbidden Lands game system that I had a problem with. And in reality, my problem with it was this isn't interesting enough. <laughs> this isn't enough of a game choice. And I wanted to create a bunch of rules to, ch to change this, to fix this and having never played the game. Now, probably for the best, I didn't have enough time to develop a comprehensive set. I'm, I'm no Mark Seifter. I can't uh, just bust out a, a complete rule set in 24 hours. Um, I didn't get a chance, we just played it, rules was written, uh, with you know me making obviously rulings and you know it's a more of an old school game a little bit in that way, so you can kind of just play off off the cuff. But nonetheless, some of the things that I was concerned about did kind of come up um, in the course of the game. Um, and so it kind of made me feel a little bit better because I was kind of like, 
oh yeah, all right. I, I was a little worried about these and sure enough, it did come up. That being said, the group explored a, 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 a brand new realm that has just emerged from basically a post-apocalyptic mist of death and the world is ready to be you know explored again. They made their way eastward across the uh, plains on the edge of the Shroud Forest. They found the burial mound of the of uh, Wolfgar Wolfsbane or Hrothgar Wolfsbane. They parlayed with goblins. They fought a death knight. Um, they recovered a magical bow and and a big bag of silver peak coins. You know, I mean, classic D and D fun. You know, it's, it's forbidden lands, but you know, classic sword and sorcery fun and. I, I can't I can't complain about that like that that is that is a win in my book, um, <laughs> yeah. Rothgar, Ruthgar, Huthgar, not gonna not gonna work here anymore. Um, <laughs> GM Scott says player. I cast a spell. All right, what does it do? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, let's go. Um. So we've talked about this before a little bit um, on the uh, on the on the channel, and this is this idea that um, fun and complexity. Let me get my let me get a bigger. There we go. That's pretty good. Um, uh, let's go over here. Um, Fun and complexity can be thought of as an X, Y scatter plot, right? And I mean, you might say ideally, right? Ideally, your game would be here, right? Which would be really fun and really interesting. But that's not true for everybody, okay? Um because oftentimes, in order to make a game interesting, you have to make the game more complicated, okay, or complex. And by the way, I do think this is this is a totally a me term. I have no idea how other people use it. Complex and complicated are different things. Uh, to me, a complex game is one that has very, very uh, detailed and complex um, mechanics for resolving things. Um, D20, by and large, is not a complex system. D uh, Pathfinder 2nd Edition is not a complex game, in my opinion. There are certain things that do make the game more complex, um, but by and large, it's D20 roll high, right? The mechanic is very well, you know, straightforward. What Pathfinder 2nd Edition is, on the other hand, is complicated. And the way you complicate something is you take in, in my opinion is you give the players the mechanics might be simple but you give them a lot of options okay if you think about a board game it might be a very simple board game and then the game has hundreds of buildings or cards that you can choose from right in pathfinder second edition you have hundreds or thousands of feats right that interact with the mechanics in a different way right you have 46 status effects in, in the system. I mean, we all know how status effects works. In fact, actually, they've done a good job of reducing the complexity of status effects in a game like Pathfinder 2nd Edition by basically saying that you only get three types of bonuses or penalties. You get item bonus, you get circumstance bonus, and you get status bonus. So that does that goes a long way towards reducing the complexity. That being said, the game is still very complicated because there's so much to, to, to deal with. And Shadram, I think, is kind of right. In fact, Complication can oftentimes create that feeling of overwhelmingness because there's so many different choices. But complication is great for longevity and great for building interest because it means that there's a ton of, you know, board gaming terms, we would call it replayability, right? If you play a board game and there's only five or six or seven different building choices or card choices, the, the game loses replayability because it's not complicated enough. The game needs all these different moving pieces that you can sort of uh, variant pieces that you can try out, even if the mechanic of it is very simple. Now, there are also games that have 
what I consider to be fairly complex uh, resolution mechanics. And I know a lot of people say burning wheel, but the actual mechanic of burning wheel isn't that complex. That being said, burning wheel has subsystems like dual of wits, okay, or, um, uh, God, what's it called? Uh, range and cover, I think is what it's called. Okay, that, in my opinion, become very complex. They're not actually complicated, but they are very complex. Um, and so that that is a way that you can build interest. But the problem is you are paying, if you will, a price to make a game interesting. You're increasing the complexity. Now, the problem that I've always had, and, you know, I, I mean, maybe this makes me a horrible person, um, but uh, let me see here. Um, maybe this makes me a horrible person. But part of the problem I have always had with, you know, many times, I mean, many, many times I have tried to play, you know, what I would call old school D&D, okay, OSR style D&D. And I got to admit, and, 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 and Smith would say the same thing. We, boy, we always have fun when we play these games. We really do, okay? I'm also going to throw a little bit of a log on the fire here of a hot take, okay? I think, I think I'm guessing I could be wrong. I think that Dragonbane falls into this same category, which is I have so much fun when I play a game like BX D and D or Labyrinth Lord or Old School Essentials or Dragon Bane. It's fun. It 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 feels like going to a popcorn movie. Like when when you've been sitting at a at, and you've been watching nothing but three hour long documentaries. Okay, or even if the movie wasn't a documentary. Okay, it was a four and a half hour period piece about the life of Napoleon. And you're just like, God, I just want some, some I want to feel alive again, please God help me. And so suddenly a game comes around where it's just like, Hey, we're, we're having fun. It, it, it's like, it feels like a breath of fresh air. It feels like a, a popcorn flick. All right. And you really, really enjoy it. The problem I have is that while I have a lot of fun with these games, in fact, I have an outlandish amount of fun, actually, um, I find them to be not that interesting, okay? So high fun, low interest. And the reason why I don't find them to be very interesting is because the mechanics are very simple. They are not complex. And the games are not particularly complicated. In fact, in some cases, the game is 10 pages long. There are no lists of spells or feats. It's just one or two things, you know, that you can do. And you get this list and that's it. And that's all that the game is as deep as it can go. You know, it's, it's, um, you know, it's like the pool on the cruise ship, right? It's not very deep. It's a shallow pool, but boy, you're having fun, right? Yeah. But if you start saying to yourself, is there anything else I could do in this pool? Except, you know, I don't know, hang out on a floating lounge chair and drink my drink? Like, could we, could we do, could we swim laps in this pool? Could I dive in this pool? Could we play water polo in this pool? Is there anything else I can do with this pool? No, no, the pool is shallow and that, that's, that's as far as you can go. And so what ends up happening as I play these games is I find that um, I, I, <laughs> Can I pee in this pool? I find that I lose interest and I get bored. And, you know, I'm curious. I wonder how many people, you know, are going to play Dragon Bane and I'm, they're going to have fun with it. But these are people by and large who, you know, are used to playing their complex role-playing games and they're used to playing their complicated video games and role-playing games. And I wonder if after 10 or 20 sessions, you start to look at your character and you go, I kind of feel like I've figured this game out. I've kind of got it all figured and it's not as interesting anymore to me. 
And while I'm still having fun, there's something else, right? Because remember, fun and interesting are not the same thing, right, as enjoyment, okay? Enjoyment is subjective. And I think that my problem is that I tend to want to create, think, make things more interesting. However, when you make something more interesting, it is very rarely ever a straight to the right shift. In my experience, this is very hard to do, okay? Whether you're home ruling or house ruling, what I have always found. Now, different people will do this at different rates. And I, I would argue that the, the, your ability, you know, if we think about this as a slope, of this, of this transferal, right? Ideally, right, the slope of this line would be zero. And you would lose no fun as you make your game more interesting. However, whatever I have found is over the years is that when people try to take a fun game and make it more interesting, and this includes me, and this includes my house rules, they inevitably succeed, but they make the game less fun. And that is a very, it feels very counterpurposed. It feels very, uh, it feels very like you're like, what, what are we, what are we doing here? This feels like this is backwards and wrong. Like we've created a more interesting game, but it's not as fun. And this is exactly what Mark Rosewater was trying to warn us against. He said, you know, don't confuse interesting with fun. Don't think that because you're making the game more interesting, you're making the more game more fun. Oftentimes you are sacrificing you know, one for another. And I would say vice versa. I think it's very easy to make your game more fun by making it less interesting, right? So in other words, it's really hard to increase the interest while maintaining the fun. It is really easy to lower the interest and increase the fun. And how do I know this? Really simple, right? What is this? This is called the rule of cool. There is no paradigm in the RPG space to me that is more indicative of a GM sensing. Okay. What we are, all GMs are, are sort of psychologists, whether you want to, whether you know it or not, you are constantly receiving feedback of your players while you're playing a game. Okay. And you are trying to constantly judge this sort of tension between my games, how interesting is my game and how fun is my game? And a lot of times what ends up happening is, and, and GMs understand that again, fun is the emotional component of a game. And the interesting is sort of the intellectual or the mental component of a game. And again, when, when you're put into a corner and you want to make sure that somebody's enjoying your game, when push comes to shove, it is a lot easier Okay, you don't have to look much further than, you know, uh, television and everything like that. It's much easier to appeal to emotion than it is to appeal to intellect. And so a lot of GMs in a moment will do basically something along the lines of, we are going to ignore these complex or complicated mechanics so that we can make the game more fun. Now, they might do this as a on-the-spot ruling that they just make up or it may be part of an integrated house rule that they are actually in, you know, putting into place. And by and large, this is successful. You have created a more fun game. But again, as I was trying to say at the beginning of this, there is, there's a price, there's a cost to be paid here. And that is that you have lowered the interest of your game. Because the, the, the depth, the complexity of the game starts to feel meaningless or it starts to feel compromised. And you start to realize that, you know, that this is, this is like the, the hidden, this is like the, 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 what's the word I'm saying for? This is like that heartbreaking moment when, you know, like maybe you're, you're working really hard for a company um, and you've been busting your ass on this incredible product. And then you realize uh, that the product you're working on is, you know, never going to be, it's never going to matter. It's never going to get released. 
And you're kind of like, well, now listen, I, I enjoyed making, you know, I, I was proud of my work. But when you realize that the effort, the skill, the mastery that you've developed in your job or in your game system doesn't really matter, that can create actually an opposite effect where it's not only, it's not only less enjoyable, it's actually actively um, repulsive. Because as, as people, we want, you know, our intellectual interest to be stimulated in a way that we, we, we feel rewarded for investing in our character. We feel invested in the game, right? This is part of the reason why I hate Mario Party, right? Because I try to get invested into the game. And then what do they throw out? They throw out random stars at the end of the game. And why do they do that? Because it's fun, it's zany. Also, it totally gives care, you know, it totally gives people who suck at the game a chance to get back in the game. You never know what's going to happen. You could be terrible at Mario Party, but if you stick around to the end of the game, you might win because woo, bonus stars. And that makes the game more fun, but it makes the game it, it shits. <laughs> it shits on the uh efforts that you put into actually being good at the game, you know? Um, and so this is, this is kind of what rule of cool can do is it can make the game kind of feel uh, pointless and it makes the game kind of feel not particularly depth uh, deep. Um, and this is why for a lot of people, you know, they say um, that it, it is the case that, uh, you know, if we play a game, uh, an RPG game that doesn't have death. If death is quote unquote off the table um, to them, a, a lot of people, including myself would say that is making the game more fun. And there are people who say that that is making the game less interesting. And I know there's people who say, no, 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 it is more interesting because you can, you know, you have to, you, you have to come up with other things and it's other intellectuals. I don't necessarily know that I agree with that. I, I do think it is it, it is a move towards making the game more fun. Um and so and, and maybe and that's okay. There is no there is no right space to be on this chart. Because like I said, even if you were over here, very interesting and very fun. And I think a lot of people in this chat would probably love this game. Okay. But there are a lot of people out there, and I mean a lot of people out there who are never ever going to want a game that is any more interesting than this or than this. And they would rather play a game that was, you know, this interesting and this fun than a game that was this interesting and this fun because it's just too much. It's just too much. It's just overwhelming. And I think that's something that the Pathfinder two community in particular misses. I think they miss that there's a lot of people out there who want their game to be more fun, but they're not willing to pay the interest tax of complication and complexity that Pathfinder 2 asks you to make. It absolutely asks you to make it. 4E asks you to do the same thing. And so I think it's important that we understand that there are these, you know, there's these very real distinctions between the two. Uh, all right, Let, let's see what's, what, what's chat up to here. We got a lot of stuff here going on. I, I, I apologize if I, I missed a lot of chats. I don't think I missed any super chats. So um, thank you for subscribing, Zatarak. Let me see how we're doing. Are we dropping streams here? No. Okay, now now our stream connection is excellent. So that's looking good. Um, so <laughs> Beowulf says, I would love to have Ben on for a two-part burning wheel stream, one where you cover the basics and deep dive circles, duel of wits, organizations, and other systems, and where you and one where you burn characters. Beowulf, that is that will happen at some point. Now that Burning Wheel has PDFs, okay, which it didn't until last Gen Con, um, until last August. Now that Burning Wheel has PDFs, we can do that. Without it, we couldn't. So that is an option that we can do. Um uh, Tundalus says, uh, going back to our definitions, uh, by these definitions, the old deck builder game, Dominion, would be a good example of a complex but uncomplicated game. Intuitive, elegant, no, no, uh, I think you mean the opposite. <laughs> but um, 
it's a it the, the, right dominion's a very simple game right but in order to stay interesting it has you have to complicate it you have to put in a lot of cards and each set has to add in 10 new cards or 20 new cards or 25 new cards so that eventually you have this massive library of cards. Um, again, those are totally just my definitions. Complex and complicated are definitely synonyms for each other. But I like to understand when it talks about TTRPGs or board games, the difference between difficult to understand mechanics versus uh, a lot of depth, you know, um, for sure. Uh, but that being said, I, Tundalus, I think you're exactly correct. And by the way, I think this is Dominion, for those of you who don't know it. It's a card builder game. It was originally produced by Rio Grande, I think. Um, and uh, David X. Vakiro or something, I think, was the game designer. It's a very basic card game. Um, and it, it's a deck builder. So you, you pick up your cards. There's 10 cards. The, the base set had 25. Um, and some of the cards were great. Some of the cards sucked. And after the, you know, you know, and but the mechanics are really simple. A, B, C, action, buy, cleanup, action, buy, cleanup, action, buy, cleanup, action, buy, cleanup. Very simple. Um, so the game itself could literally take minutes to teach. That being said, you had 25 different cards, each of which did a different thing, and you had to pick 10 of them. But after you played it for about 10 or 20 times, you start to go, okay, well, some of these cards suck some of these cards are great and we've seen a lot of these interactions and now the game is starting to become bored because the mechanics of the game aren't deep enough to truly allow us this kind of really deep gameplay seven wonders falls into the same category um and so what dominion did and was very successful at because people said, but, but we like these mechanics. We don't want you to make the mechanics, mechanics more complex, even though they did a little bit, you know, a little bit, right? Like they added uh, the shipping uh, the orange tile cards in uh, uh, seafarers or whatever it's called seaside. And uh, they added the alchemy expansion, which nobody liked, but like, so they did, they, they did increase the complexity a little bit, but by and large, they kept the game the same. What they did is give us 25 new cards and 25 new cards. And that is essentially punting. You are just saying, hey, here's a new set of challenges. Here's a new set of cards for you to unexplore and understand. And you know, by and large, it worked. I, I mean, I think they're still making Dominion expansions. It does not have the omnipresence that it once did, but it, it, it was a good example of a game that could do that. Um. Zadarok says, you really sound like Squirrel Hermit. All right. Uh, should I know who Squirrel? I mean, I know that Squirrel Hermit was in the chat earlier. Um, well, thank you, Zadarok. Appreciate it. Is Squirrel, is Squirrel Hermit somebody that I should know? Like from YouTube or something? But well, thank you for your first super chat. Appreciate it. Um, <laughs> so... London says horizontal complexity can be sacrificed with ease. Vertical complexity should be respected or left behind for another system. Thoughts. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, here's the thing though. Um, I don't know that that's, I don't know that that's, that's, that should be true. I mean, like, can you sacrifice horizontal? I mean, because a lot of times, Horizontal complexity is the choices that you have to make in the system. And a lot of times that is what, you know, makes, makes the game tick. Okay. Thank you, Zadar. Okay. Cause I was like, I was like, I was like, wait, did I miss something in chat? But I missed it. Okay. Yes. You're, you're saying he's a friend of yours and I sound like him. All right. Fa fantastic. Well, I will take that as a compliment. Squirrel Hermit is the nuts then. Um, so yeah, um, so I don't necessarily know that I agree with that, London. Um, I think you, I think you have to be very careful about all of these things. Um, so yeah, uh, Pumpkin loves Dominion and other deck builders. I mean, I think they were fun, they were fine, but I will be honest with you, I don't play them anymore um, because once I really found that the mechanic was solved, um, you know, I mean, I mean, this is super deep nerd shit, but like the truth of the matter is, in Dominion, you really only need maybe like like 10 to 15 like you want to use your action each turn obviously but you really only need like you know because you're drawing you only need one action out of a hand of five so you only need like 20 percent 
of your deck to be action cards. And obviously the, you need to kind of increase the action cards as you buy um, uh, silver and gold and platinum if you're playing with it. But a lot of times the best thing to do is just fill your deck with gold. And, you know, ideally you would have something like 25% action cards, 75% gold, and then start basically buying provinces until the game ends. Now, hopefully I didn't like ruin the game for anybody, but like that strategy, you know, by and large is just going to win pretty much every time. Um, and so suddenly the game becomes a lot less interesting because the fact of the matter is each game you're getting 10 new exciting action cards, but I'm not really going to buy them. I'm going to be buying the silver and gold that are available every game and are unlimited. So it, it loses a lot of its, uh, loses a lot of its luster. And by the way, this is a classic example where people, self-serving people can ruin the game for themselves. Okay. All, a lot of us, not all of us. Okay. But a lot of us, we did that to Pathfinder second edition, right? We liked Pathfinder second edition. <laughs> Quick and Dirty says he's out because this stream is no longer fun nor interesting. He put the JK in there, but I would have respected you more if you didn't. <laughs> take care. Uh, take care, Quick and Dirty. Um, uh, <laughs> now, I think my buddy George is in the chat. Uh, George is famous for buying a ton of villages. He'll play a village, draw a card, play another 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 village, draw a card, and then have f five gold. <laughs> And be like, I, I buy, I buy another village. <laughs> uh, um, anyways, um, so, <laughs> uh, I don't even remember what we were talking about. Um, yeah. So anyways, a Pathfinder second edition, right? So many of us liked this game so much that we, we, we went so deep, um, and, we kind of ruined it for ourselves, right? Because we we made the game, you know, there there's there comes a point because sometimes players could do this to themselves, right? Where in the in the pursuit of making the game as interesting as possible and trying to just obsess over the mechanics, you you forget about the fun and you leave it behind in in the pursuit of the more interesting game mechanic, of the most interesting thing. And then when you suddenly reach that point, the point where you've solved it, you did it, you beat the game, you figured it out, you cracked the code, congratulations. Well, what are you left with then? Nothing. Because you've sacrificed the, the, the fun to get to this point, and now the game doesn't hold a lot of interest. And a lot of people might say, well, yeah, but you could go back and you could play a more fun character. You know, you don't have to play the hyper-optimized character. Go play this character. Who's that character? Oh, that's the 14 strength fighter you know, who's, uh, who's really focused on using a one-handed dagger and a offhand uh, net and who, you know, took uh, high wisdom so that they could you know, multi-class. You know, I, you get my point. Like, this character is, in theory quote unquote, more fun. But the fact of the matter is you can't turn your brain off. Okay. I've been, we've, you've been this player. You've, you know who I'm talking to. I'm talking to you. You have thought about doing this or you have done this. And you know what you realized? You're really fucking bored. Okay. And because at a certain point, it's like when you play a board game with somebody, maybe they're a kid or maybe they're a loved one, or maybe they're new to the game. Okay, and you realize you are purposefully making suboptimal moves. And once you do that, the game is no longer fun. You know, this is one of the reasons why, you know, golf is a good example of this. Golf doesn't ask the better player to throw shots, okay, or to, or to you know, fudge their, you know, purposely hit bad shots in order to make the game competitive. It has the idea of a handicap. And Go does the same thing. And so this allows a really good golfer and a really bad golfer to play together and, in theory, uh, have a competition and, you know, have to perform against themselves and their opponent because it sort of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, makes uh, makes the game more fair. This is really hard to do in an RPG. I mean, you can handicap yourself by making a, you know, a deficient character, but 
it's not a comp- it's not a competition. So at the end of the day, you just kind of feel like, man, I'm, I feel like I'm just being dumb. And I mean, again, I'm not saying that you have to feel this way. I'm just saying that a lot of us do. And so now the game is both not interesting and it's not fun. And so we just don't enjoy it. And so what ends up happening a lot of times with these people, this goes back all the way to the 5e optimizers, but it goes to the Pathfinder 2 characters as you go, no, I've just got to make the game harder. I've got to make the game more interesting. I need more choices, more tactics, more strategies, harder monsters, more difficult situations because I just, I need to keep climbing the mountain. I reached the top. I, I, I can't go back down. I got to keep going higher. But at a certain point, the game cannot support that. And it just falls apart. And I think that that is what, you know, we have seen uh, for a lot of people in the Knights of Last Call with Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Um, but we've seen it in a wider range with the hobby, particularly with 5e d and uh, And the people who want so much more out of this game then the game is capable of giving you. It's like, look, the mechanic is advantage, disadvantage, and that's they cancel each other, you know, whatever, and that's it. And you're like, no, I need more nuance. I need the game to be more complex and more complicated. I need more choices, and I need more complex decision-making. And at a certain point, the game collapses. It is not designed to support that. Uh, and then people, you know, get, get, they get burned out. They leave the game or they... Uh, you know, try to do something else. And I, and I agree. That is when you find a new hyper fixation. That's when you learn to play a different game. Those are all really excellent choices. But there are other considerations to make. The people you play with may not be at the same point on the journey as you are. They may not be so willing or able to suddenly shift and play a completely different game. You may have a lot of money invested in that game system. And it's not something that you can just casually walk away from because of financial considerations or time considerations. So it, 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 it leaves you in a really weird spot. Um, you know, Mark Rosewater said in his 20 lessons that, the players of your game. That's us, by the way. That's us. Um, are very good at recognizing problems in your game and really, really bad at creating solutions to problems in your game. And, you know, I think part of the problem is a lot of times uh, it, we can't help ourselves. We we kind of ruin the game for ourselves. Um, and what ends up happening is for some people, they are constantly sort of chasing that fix and they're bouncing around from game system to game system. Guilty, uh, a guilty as charged. Uh, but for other people, they get stuck because they cannot just walk away from the game system that they're playing. They're stuck playing whatever game system, probably fifth edition D and D. Um, exactly. And a wife that convinced you to tolerate, you're spending that book cash on the hardback books. Um, and like that's, um, that's a, that's a tough spot to be in. Uh, and and it's like, I don't necessarily know what the, the true, what the answer is, but I just think there's a lot of people who just want so much out of these games and they want them to be fun and they want them to be interesting. Um, but sometimes in the pursuit of that, they actually end up just ruining the experience for them completely. And this all cycles back to, you know, what I was recently dealing with, with Forbidden Lands which is a game system based off of the year zero engine. And I really like it. I think it's great. Okay. But there were some mechanical irregularities that to me made certain decision-making uh, sort of not particularly challenging. And I wanted the game to be challenging. I wanted the game to be interesting. I wanted that game to, you know, take uh, some amount of figuring out to do. And I felt like without changing the rules uh, that the game would be maybe particularly solvable. So I proposed a bunch of house rules before we even played. And I'm glad that I didn't go through with them yet. But I mean, our playthrough kind of indicated that some of these things are real issues. 
But at the same time, the truth of the matter is, and I knew this because this is true almost every single time I make any sort of changes or Aaron makes any sort of changes in games. I was going to be trading fun for interest plus complexity. And once upon a time, this was a uh, this was a trade that I would make all day every day. I almost didn't care if I had fun. As sick as that sounds. But the fact of the matter is, maybe it's cuz I'm older. I'm in my 40s now. But a lot of times how I feel before a session, during a session, after a session is way more important to me than how mentally difficult or challenging was that game. And that is part of the reason why, you know, we talked about this when we talked about like the Magic the Gathering player profiles. And I used to say that, you know, I, I don't know that I was ever really a spike, you know, but I, I, I was definitely, you know, kind of somewhere in the line between, you know, Spike and Johnny. And I've kind of started to become more like a Timmy, right? I, I want, <laughs> and that's how PVTA Derek was born. I mean, Gonza, that is where PBT, yeah, I mean, that is where it started, Gonza. It really did. Um, it, it for sure start, you know. Um, and uh, right, I was playing 4E D and D, and 4E D and D is, you know, uh, for ED and D is a spike and a Johnny's players, you know, wet dream. But I was also going to Gen Con and I was starting to play this, this new apocalypse world and dungeon world and monster hearts game. Um, and I started to have a ton of fun, like an insane amount of fun. And by the way, I mean, it, it, it is a bit like leaving. I mean, this is, I, I I'm not trying to diminish this, but it's like, it, it's a it's a little bit le like leaving an abusive relationship, and I don't necessarily mean a domestic one. I just mean any um, relationship. When I see, I see a lot of people who have been really focused for a long time on the sort of Spike Johnny deep in the numbers, very high frequency, you know. Um, complex math and eking out advantages and edges. And then I see them play a game like Dragon Bane. And, and I, I have been really like, I've been asking people for weeks and, and all my patron members know this, like, what is it about this game? And, and people are asking, like, are people acting like, like it is like them being born again. And I think, I think in some ways it is because they have for a long time, whether they want to admit it or not, they have sucked the fun out of their gaming experience at the reason, the, the reason being that because they crave this intellectual stimulation, this mental challenge, this complexity. And they thought that that was what was going to give them this enjoyment and, and pushing that and seeking that and pushing that and seeking that. And so then they start playing this game that kind of throws a lot of that complexity and almost all of that complication out the window. And it's like a breath of air. Like they, they didn't realize that they couldn't breathe. And they, and they come out of this session and they go, I, 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 had, I had feelings. I, I was excited. I, I felt things. That was very unusual. It was very strange. I, I think I liked it. And, they're, and it's like, you know, it's like they're uh, born again. Um, but I do wonder, will over time, these players, and I'm including myself when I say these players, will they ruin the game as they ruin all games? And I'm including myself here because they're going to be playing this game and then it's fun. But after a few sessions or maybe after they make a new character and they kind of realize that the new character 
it's kind of basically exactly like their old character or it's like a another character that was in the party and that like at a certain point they start going like oh wouldn't it be great if we could add this wouldn't it be cool if we could create this or what if we what if we made this a more complex you know more challenging set of circumstances right and they will do they will complicate and complex the fun out of the game it's, it's what we do and so you might say okay so then you should just leave it alone I don't know, because then you get bored. That's what happens to me. That's what happens to me. I get bored. You know, I get bored with the game. So this is a long a, a way of saying I, I think, have been searching for. We got fun. We got interesting. Okay. I have okay. Obviously, we can all agree that anything in this quadrant, right? This is just this is just completely crazy right um no nobody should be playing a game that is neither fun nor interesting um but i think what i have decided determined is that while this game is my is my holy grail um uh, right like that's that's the that's the shimmering holy grail that that i would love to think I, you know the fact of the matter is i think past a certain point like it, it is very difficult to make a game that is that interesting and that fun um, but I feel like I have played and I've focused on a lot of games that sort of, you know, live out over here. And I've played a lot of games that kind of live out over here. And I think what I've been looking for recently is a game that sort of just, you know, lives in here. Um, and, um, <laughs> This, are we making a hot, crazy matrix now? Yes, exactly. This, this is a unicorn. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is the kind of like, this is the game of competition. Um, and so I realized that kind of what I want is a game that actually is kind of just in the middle. I want a game that is fun, but isn't just all like, woohoo, fun, baby, just make it up, whatever. Oh, we drop frames. That was on me, I think. Hold on a second here. Jesus Christ. The whole the whole system is the is YouTube dying a little bit. Um Yeah, we uh Yeah, we we it, it stopped sending data. Again, uh, so yeah, it's, it seems fine now. Again, I try 40, yeah, we'll start streaming in 480i. No, I mean, like, my internet speed is, should be fine here. Let me see what it says. I don't know, like, I don't think my internet speed has been a problem, but, you know, you never know. Um, I wish I had the fiber optic, I'll say that. I don't necessarily know, again, it could just be the, you know, the, whatchamacallit, the, uh, the YouTube server itself. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm uploading at 20 megabytes per second, which is more than enough for the bit rate that I'm doing. Um, so it's fine. Um, everybody, three, two, one. Gonza confirming it is YouTube. Yeah, I mean, like, because remember, I have to send stuff to them and they have to send stuff to me. What is going on? Ugh, what a mess. Um, stats, here we go. All right. Anyways, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm looking at my, I'm looking at my streaming chats. Um, so anyways, I, 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 uh, I do not know what symmetric internet means, Nutromancer. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I think that the issue here is, that house rules are great, okay. Uh, going back to the house rules comment, um, I think I try I try to let the majority of house rules happen organically during play. I think that's a great way of of discuss of doing the game. However, I do think that part of the problem with that is that it can come at the sacrifice of the game session itself. At a certain level, I don't necessarily want my players to sort of to have every game session turn into a 
you know, trying to figure things out and we're trying to have this discussion and I'm just making a, a ruling off the cuff and I don't know what the long-term consequences of, our, of that are. I think it's great to have house rules that happen organically like that, but it can be very difficult to sort of codify them and it can be very difficult to remind yourself of them and it can be very difficult to sort of manage them. Um, and so that's, I mean, I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm just saying that that is the problem. Um, so yeah. Hey, our good friend, the self-confessed cynic. House rules can make unicorns if you believe hard enough. All right, I will say this, okay, in defense, in defense of house rules and in, in, in the defense of unicorns, if you have a very uh, well-congealed group, then in theory, what you can do is you can start with a game that's maybe here and you can have the mental awareness and ability to make, now remember, like I said, making a shift this way is very difficult, I personally believe. I'm gonna add a mechanic to the game and it's gonna make it more fun and more interesting. That's kind of tough. But what you can do, I think, is make little tiny shifts micro shifts over the course of many, many sessions, because this is you, this isn't you creating a better game. This is you creating a better experience specifically for this group, because you know your group and you know who you are and you say, we all absolutely find this mechanic, not even, it, it's in the game, it adds complexity, but none of us think it's interesting. So we can remove it and replace it with something more fun. And that is a free win for us. Yes, the game as a whole has become less complex and therefore, on, in theory, less interesting. But none of us like that part or none of us played with that and we never, none of us ever will. So if you can make those micro adjustments over a very long period of time, you can end up with something that arguably is in the unicorn category, but it will be hyper-focused and hyper-fixated on that precise uh, group. And God forbid a new person ever join your group because that could just throw off the entire dynamic. So I do think there's a little bit of truth to that, but that also gets down to a juice versus squeeze issue, right? Like how much work are you putting in order to do that, right? And every time you create a new house rule, you are increasing the mental bandwidth of the group. Uh, you're, you're, you're acquiring a saying, hey, you know the rules that you can look up, the rules that are available online, those no longer apply to us because we have made oh, well, in our game, it does this. But, oh, no, in our game, it does this. No, remember, in our game, it does this. So, you know, anyways, good to see you, buddy. Um, Do I get the same upload and download? No, Nutramancer. My download is like 200 uh, megabits per second, and my upload is usually about 20 to 25 megabits per second. But I'm on cable, and there isn't fiber optic available in my neighborhood. So there we go. Reason number 752 that I wish that I could move um, and buy a bigger house for no other reason than to, to keep the studio going. I'm going to enjoy this uh, soda really quick. You all enjoy the. Horizon Good stuff. Um, anyways, uh, uh, let's take a look here. Nightfinder would never be hyper focused, though. Uh, that is well, that is true. I mean, I will say that when you create a game that is very specific, then you can create specific rules that serve that exact purpose. And so even in a, in a way, you can kind of increase the interest without raising the complexity. Um, and that could be a really big win. But the, the price you pay there is hyper, hyper focused. When you create a more generic game, I think it becomes a lot harder because the generic game has to be able to handle a wider range of different options and a different circumstances and different possibilities. And you know, it could be, 
it could be, uh, you know, you're not creating the best mechanic for that particular resolution. You're creating the most okayest mechanic, right? That can fit the widest range, the widest range of possibilities. This is part of the problem that I have with game design is that the, at the end of the day, game design is about compromising your vision in some ways. Um, you know, the only person who probably doesn't do that is Luke Crane. And Luke Crane is kind of loved, but also reviled, um, you know, uh, for creating games that are purpose, almost, you know, obtuse. And to the point where, you know, Luke Crane is happy to create a game and no one will play it. He, you know, it's almost like, I mean, I'm not trying to like completely say that that is the case, but like he, he, he isn't trying to pander to any sort of audience. Um, but when you're creating a game, I mean, right, you're, you're, you want people to play it. Uh, and so there's kind of this weird tension, especially if you're in the business of making games. We got another super chat from Vin. <laughs> super chat for big releases. Let's go. Do not believe the indie lies. Hey, you played an indie game. You played Dread when you were here. Sure. It was Dread, Dread 3.5 slash Pathfinder 1. But you played Dread, and Dread's an indie game. So, and you enjoyed it. So don't, don't, don't come to me with your with your indie lies here. Um uh, to, uh, to be fair, okay, okay is mechanics are behind the most popular games ever made. I reckon in a way, okay is the best form. Y yes. I mean, to a certain extent, that is that is true. I mean, especially if you want to sell product and you want to get people engaged with your game. And to be clear. You know, one of the things that I talk about when I want out of a role playing game is I want tools, right? I, I'm I am less interested these days in mechanics and I am more interested in in tools, interesting tools that allow me to sort of um, assess bonuses and penalties, especially if they go beyond simply manipulating your chance of success, either up or down. If all that a mechanics, all if all of the tools available to you essentially boil down to, do you get a bonus to hit or do you get a penalty to hit? Um, you know, do you do more damage or do you do less damage? If those are the only options available to me, I start to feel very uh, trapped as a GM. Um, so one of the things that we we talked about doing here was putting putting games on on a uh, putting no well-known games onto a chart. I don't know if this is a completely fool's errand, but we'll try. Now, I'm going to put a disclaimer here. I might even have to write it, okay? This is my opinion, okay? That means that I'm not really wrong and I'm not really right. It's just how I feel, all right? All right. Um, so we've got we've got interesting down here, and we've got fun. Where the hell's my thing? Here we go. We got fun over here. All right. So let's start. Let's start with the D and Ds. Okay. Let's start. Let's start with our good old friends, the Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. Oh God. Things are flying off. All right. Um, Let's start with the game that we all know and love. Let's start with third edition Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. So where does third edition's D and D go? It's a great question. Um, let's see. Uh, all right. <sighs> uh, <laughs> here we go here. Charts are both always and never a waste of time. Totally true. A hundred percent true. Um, if it's on a chart, it has to be true. That is also true. Um, narrative mechanics can go right into the bottom right-hand corner and go fuck themselves. Um, you playing those Dungeons and Dragons again? All right. So we've got, we've got third edition D and D. Where, where do I think third edition D&D rise, right? So we start here at the middle, right? At, at this idea of this perfect sort of um, meeting point of interest and fun. And again, this is 
totally an, a relative scale. This this doesn't necessarily mean like I mean it means less interesting. It doesn't necessarily like I'm not putting a scale on this graph. Okay, like I'm not saying this is zero and this is ten. There's no absolute scale here. Okay, it's it's just relative. All right. I am going to say, and let me, let me get a couple other ones up on here. Let's get four E, D and D on this. And again, feel free to tell me I'm wrong and we will happily debate it in the chat. Um, okay. All right. And then we got five E, D and D. Okay. I'm not really going to do second edition d and I mean, we could, but it's it's very similar to first edition d and And we've got, all right. These are the D&Ds. I, I mean, I know second edition a lot too, but second edition is pretty much going to come to the same place. All right. So <clears throat> we have to put these into some sort of relative order. Um, so I would say this, I would say that for me, and, and I'm just talking out loud here, um, these games, I'm putting them on the left side, uh, be, because they're, they're not as interesting, right? These games are not as interesting. I actually think that third edition D and D is a little less interesting as well. So again, these are all just ab relative things. I think fourth edition D and D is more interesting. And I think fifth ed edition D and D is probably about as interesting. Maybe actually, you know what? It is less interesting to me than third edition D and D. So, <laughs> uh, are they less interesting because they've been overdone? I think in this case, interesting to me means as a game, as a complex system of interactions, right? Do I feel like there is enough complexity and complication in the inherent game mechanics? Is there enough progression? Is there enough bite? Is there enough um, depth? Now, depth can mean a lot of different things to people. For some people, it might be rules mechanics, but other people might say that the game's depth comes from uh, lore and the depth of that. But the idea predominantly is that interesting usually comes up from a result of adding some form of complexity to the game. It is very rare that you can make a game deeper and more rich and interesting, whether it's with mechanics or lores or laundry lists of spells and feats and not make the game, you know, thicker, longer, deeper, <laughs> uh, more words, more pages, more paragraphs, right? To fully understand games, we must ask ourselves two questions. One, how fun has the objective of that game been? And two, how interesting is that objective? Now, I want you to take that very excellent ex essay by Dr. M. R. Pritchard, and I want you to rip it out of your book. Rip it out, rip it all out. Um, anyways, uh, for the record, Dead Poets Society is one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, uh, <laughs> Right, we can we can we can plot the x y axis, and then as a result, uh, the uh, greatness of the game can be determined. That is actually somewhat true. All right, we did got a super chat here from Vin. Oddly enough, I feel like gaminess shifts things towards the top right, so long as it doesn't uh, devolve into decompression rules. Um, and that that is, I think that's a, I think that's an important point to make, which is again, I cannot stress this enough. There is a cost associated with going to the right. Oh, sorry, that's your left. <laughs> With going to the right. right. So when you increase the interest, you are increasing the complexity. And it can reach a point where in order to keep increasing the depth and the complexity of the game, okay, you end up having to make sacrifices. And you end up having to make, uh, it could be, it could, it's a diminishing return where you have to really increase the complexity and scope of your game just to gain a little bit more interest. Now, of course, there are elegant designs. There are certain video games and card games and board games that, you know, are just such revolutions because they figure out a way to really, you know, drive us 
towards this upper right-hand corner, but they do so without increasing the complexity. So for me personally, I think that first edition AD&D is the least fun. Um, it is probably a little more interesting than BX D and D, but I think BX D and D kind of is really fun. Like it's incredibly fun, but there is almost no depth to this game. I mean, not to be mean, but like this game is only slightly less shallow than Dragon Bane. And I think that the, when people are talking about it and they're talking about the Dragon Bane sessions, I, I feel like it's a lot of what I talked about BX. To be clear, I think Dragon Bane is a, is a potentially better game than BX D&D. And I really like BX D&D. I cannot stress this enough. I've played this game a lot and it is near and dear to my heart and I love it. And I think it's really, really fun. But I get bored with it really quickly because not only is there not a lot of meat to the game, um, but you know there's not there's not a whole lot of even in the mechanics. And even if you are just making up a bunch of house rules and rulings, the number of levers that you have available to pull is quite limited. Um, that being said, um, there's a bias that comes here. Uh, yeah, it's very shallow. That's a part of its appeal to me. Well, and you know we could take that shallow analogy for Dragon Bane even a bit further. Dragon Bane is great for people who don't know how to swim because it's shallow end of the pool. You're not asking them to swim. You're just asking them to get, you know, get in the pool, you know? And that that's very appealing. It feels very safe, you know? Um, and I think that is what is, you know, so in it, which is such, such a win. All right. Which game do I think, let's just say that, which game do I think is more interesting and has more depth? All right. Well, third edition has more depth. For sure. Then fifth edition D and D. Fifth edition D and D does not really interest me that much, but it is fun. I, I, I think I put fifth edition D and D like here, and I put third edition D and D like here. Now, by the way, third edition D and D, you might say, okay, this game kind of, doesn't this kind of fit your middle, Derek, of where you were talking about wanting the ideal game to be? Yes. But remember, like I said, um, I don't want to make a chart for a chart, but <laughs> I'm going to make a chart for a chart because, you know, what? we've done this. We've done this chart before, but this is the game's, right? This is the game's depth. This is the game's complexity. This is the game's interest, okay? Um, sorry. This is the game's depth. This is how interesting the game is. And this is the game's complexity. Now, science, in my opinion, has not figured out a way to increase interest without increasing complexity, right? Ideally, if, we, if you could figure out a way to make your game way more interesting and have a lot more depth without adding any complexity to it, boy, you would, uh, you, that, you would have yourself uh, a nice, nice game, okay? So, complexity. My problem is, that some games, like, to reach this level, okay, of interest, you may have a game that would be really, 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 really well designed that does it in this much complexity. And then you might have a game that isn't as elegant. You know, you know what I mean when I say elegant game design? Like we've, we've talked about this on this channel before. We've talked about things like resonance. We've talked about things like mechanics that just people can guess what the mechanic would be. And they're right because it makes sense because it follows from your intuitive understanding. You know, one of the big revolutions that happened with D20 in third edition in 2000 was they said, you know, you used to have a separate mechanic for thief skills. You used to have a separate mechanic for bend bars and lift gates. You had a separate mechanic for, you know, um, listening. You had a separate mechanic for turning undead. You had a separate mechanic for attack rolls. You had a separate mechanic for saving throws. Some of them used D20. Some of them used percentages. Some of them used 2D6. D20 said, hey, those are a lot of cool, interesting things, but can't we make the game a lot less complex by just making it all a D20 roll? 
And, you know, while there may be people who say that there's a, you know, a charm to having all of those different uh, resolution systems, by and large, they are correct. So what I was going to say is there are some games that are more elegantly designed, okay, like this game. And then there are games that aren't as elegantly designed, okay? And it takes them more complexity to get to the same level of depth or interest. And then there are really, really, really badly designed games, okay, that have a ton of complexity. But all of these have the same depth. They're just paying for it differently. This game is paying for it with this much complexity. This game is paying for it with that much complexity. And this game is paying for it with this much complexity. And by and large, while having depth and interest is a good thing, I generally find that, you know, uh, what does Mark Twain say? I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long letter instead. I'm like, have you ever read a game that you could have, you're like, this game seems so deep. Or maybe a video game, you know, where you're like, wow, there's so much gameplay to this game. But then when you take a step back and you look at the book, you go, wow, this, this game isn't really that, uh, this game isn't really that thick. The, 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 this, this book is only this thick. Or, or this video game, actually, there's not that many controls. There's not that many different systems. Why does this feel so uh, interesting then? Why does this feel so in-depth? And I'm going to make a come somewhat a somewhat hot take. Huh. Lance, that is completely true. I didn't have time to make a short video, so I made a long one instead. That is literally like everything on this channel. Um. bit of a not, a, not a bit of a hot take, but um, we talked about before about how there's this idea for me of complexity and complication. You know, in, in, in D20 terms, complexity is your mechanics. Complication is all your feats, classes, and spells. My sense, generally, this is, again, my opinion, is that games that feel super depth, deep and have a ton of interest but don't really seem that complicated, aren't. They just have very elegant, interesting, complex mechanics. And the way that they achieve their depth, okay, is by creating these very elegant systems that by themselves create deep and emergent gameplay. That's really hard to do. What's way easier to make your game deeper and to make your game have more longevity and more stuff to crack the code and figure out. What's way easier is just complicating your game and filling it with endless piles of feats and classes and spells. And you know that this is true because the go-to of pretty much every game that has come out in the last 25 years is to say, here are some more classes. Here are some more feats. Here are more spells. And they, they are, and you know, we talked about Dominion, the card game. That is what they did. You know, they very rarely ever, they didn't, they basically did not tweak the mechanics. What they did instead was just say, here's more cards. Here's more cards. Here's more cards. Here's more cards. Okay. And so they keep the game interesting and in depth, but they do it. You know, I, I'm not trying to say that this is like the easy way, but it, it's kind of the easy way. Right. And this is the, this is the hard way. And, you know, sometimes you find a game that seems very in just, it feels so deep, 
but it's a very thin game. You're, you know, you actually are kind of shocked at the depth of the gameplay that can emerge from this game, even though it doesn't have like 500, you know, source books. But then there are other games where you go, look at this freaking five foot tall stack of books, you know, and our good friend Galarian in depth, check out his YouTube channel. If you're interested in all things Galarian lore, I'm sure Gid has a lot to say about the upcoming, a uh, 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 deicide that is coming. Uh, adding complications is also the more profitable way. <laughs> totally correct. How could we, we can't, we can't, we can't just skip over that. You're completely correct. Because if you create a truly robust mechanic, which creates deep and engaging gameplay, and you release that, then people will buy your game and they'll never buy anything else because there's nothing else to buy. You know? They did it. You did it. You succeeded. You created this awesome, complex, deep game that's hopefully pretty fun. And the mechanics themselves will create the deep gameplay. But then how do you sell another book? And how do you sell the book after that? And how do you sell the book after that? And there is a quote, which I am sure that all of you have heard of, okay, which is, um, you know, something, I, I just kind of randomly pulled this off of the internet, right? Complicate to profit, <laughs> right? Like that. that is a, a a generally acceptable, a generally accepted saying amongst, you know, sales and all these other people. If you make the system, the deal, the whatever more complicated, you'll make more money, you know? And Neutromancer, I completely agree with you. This is the reason why fate is deep, but it's not profitable. It's not profitable because fate doesn't, ex doesn't have this complication. How do you complicate fate? You can't, you know? That being said, you know, uh, it is kind of tough to complicate Blades in the Dark as well. But Fate is by far uh, the hardest one to do. Um, and, you know, like, you know, and while I think that Blades in the Dark is also not the most complicated game and it's tough to make profit, Fate is the worst. You are absolutely right. Fate is in its essential nature a, a, a game that doesn't really benefit from that. Um, so anyways, my point, all I was trying to make with this is that we going back to this chart, my problem is that third edition, while it exists in this kind of sweet spot, right? Where I was saying the middle of the road, where it's, it's interesting. I find third, I find third edition, right? Way more interesting than either any of these three games, but I will admit and this is Derek of 40 years old talking, but also, you know, with a mind towards Derek of 20 when third edition came out. Um, no, I was 18. Um, you know, uh, I think nowadays I would probably have honestly more fun with fifth edition D&D. &D. And that's just because, you know, which of these two games would I enjoy more? It's tough to say, you know, I think it'd be really tough. It'd be really close. Um, but what I will say about this fifth edition game is because we don't have this on this two axis dimension, but I think that third edition D and D pays a very steep price. Okay. I'm not saying it's this one, <laughs> right? But you know, third edition D and D is definitely more this line than this line. If this is the elegant line, the one that allows you to increase the depth of your game without increasing the complexity and the and the difficulty, um, then third edition is not that. Third edition pays, in my opinion, a pretty steep price. And even when I was playing third edition D and D, I would frequently find myself getting to the point where I would say, I don't want to allow more source books. I mean, Pathfinder One, I basically banned everything outside of the core rulebook. You know, to use Pathfinder 2 terminology, which didn't exist at the time, but I basically did the same thing. In Pathfinder 1, I made everything that was outside of the core rulebook uncommon and anything inside the core rulebook was allowed um, because I just got overwhelmed. It was too complicated. It, there was too much stuff going on. And so I think 3rd edition, while it exists in this really cool space, it, uh, it, it is pretty complicated. Now, 
The same thing is true of 4th edition D&D. I think 4th edition D&D is both more fun than 3rd edition, and I think it's more interesting. So is that it? This is the best game? No, because 4th edition is so complicated. There are so many rules, and there are so many rules interactions, and there are so many, there's like, there is literally like 8,000 different powers. Uh, there's oh, thousands of feats. There is, you know, bonuses that go away at the end of your next turn or at the start of your next turn or at the end of the foe's next turn. Or the, And there's, you know, it, it is a very, like, it is a very complex game. It creates a very interesting game, a deep game, a fun game. But my God, is it, is it, is it, you know, complicated there's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts to a fourth edition game there's absolutely a lot of moving parts to a fourth edition game and so it pays that price for that um all right boothby question do you differentiate which you would rather play versus which you would rather gm how does that change your fun and interesting preference great question boothby that's a great question um well By and large, hmm. I think it really comes down to it. How much work do I have to do as a GM? Like when I look at these five games that are on the board here, the two that scare me the most in terms of my GM preferences uh, are, are fourth edition and third edition. Like those are games where I could almost be considering myself wanting to play more than GM only because um, the prep work here is quite a lot. Whereas the prep work on the left can be minimal to non-existent. Um, and so for me, in terms of like the interest and the complexity, it really comes down. I don't really care about the rules complexity because whether I'm the player or the GM, I want to know the rules probably equally well. But what it really comes down to is how much work do I have to do in order to get a adventure or get a combat encounter or get a dungeon to the table and you know selfishly i want something that's not going to take a lot of time um and third edition is honestly probably uh the, the the worst of the two of them now it's interesting too that beowulf says gm interest if i had to pick beowulf if i had to pick i would actually completely swap that around for me so beowulf is saying you know he likes gming interesting games and playing fun games i'm actually the opposite if i had to pick I would prefer to GM a fun game and play an interesting game. And the reason for that is because I, as a player of games, I like Warhammer. I like uh, Magic the Gathering. I like Caverna. I like uh, complex board games that have a lot of moving parts. I like solving the puzzle. I like figuring out how, and, you know, the GM is presenting me with a puzzle and it's my job to use the mechanics to beat it. So I like playing interesting games, but when I'm the GM, I'm already in on the solution as a GM. I want to play a fun game where I can just go with the flow and not worry about, you know, shitting on hundreds of pages of rules text that again, somebody may have taken the time to go and learn. And they may have chosen their feet from a list of a thousand different feats. And they went on and they read every single feat and they thought about it and they thought about the rules and the interaction and they made that choice. And by God, I want to, you know, I want to, I want to acknowledge that choice. I want to respect that choice. But when I'm playing BX D and D, there's no fucking feats. There's not even skills. So for me, I like, I would much rather GM the fun game. Uh, and play the interesting game. And by the way, the fun games tend to be lower prep. <laughs> so <laughs> that is that is a nice little ancillary benefit. Um, but uh, let me know, you know, throw, throw, a, throw a super chat or a tip out there if there's another game that you want me to uh, to rank in this uh, in this system. Um, so somebody said like we should make we should we can use the size of them to reflect <laughs> the complexity. <laughs> Uh, I actually think 5e, 5e actually might be 
more complex than Um, someone suggested Hackmaster for the chart. Well, which version of Hackmaster? I'm assuming we mean Hackmaster 5th edition. Um, all right. Hackmaster. Nutrimancer says 5e is definitely more complex be complex than BX. I did, I made it bigger. See? The 5e the 5e covers BX. I just don't again, you know, honestly, I I kind of, you know, <laughs> I kind of don't play 5e by all the rules anyways, so um you know what? This is where this got copy pasted just randomly and this might be the correct location and the correct size. <laughs> so like that's totally random. But honestly, I think I think I think Hackmaster is a really interesting game. By the way, remember, um, for those of you who may be watching this later, what we're saying is size corresponds to the game's complexity. Slash difficulty. Um you know, uh, it, 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 and, and you know what? And this is something that I was trying to say during the stream, Nutrimancer. That is absolutely right. Hackmaster 4th Edition, which is not what I have here on the, the screen, okay, was originally a parody. And it was deliberately making fun of how, you know, obtuse and silly and, you know, some of the rules are. And then doubling down on them and creating like a million different versions of it. 5th um, Edition Hackmaster definitely got rid of the complete parody of its roots. That being said, there is still sort of a tongue in cheek nature to the game where they are kind of like going a little, they're going over the top with making the game so deep, but at the cost of some really high levels of complexity. And as far as the fun goes, you know, I think that, you know, it, it probably stacks up pretty similarly to first edition D A D and D maybe even a little bit more fun, but boy, you, it is a very complex game with a lot of rules and, you know, you're gonna have to know them and, and again, you could ignore them, I suppose, but then what are we playing this game for? Um, all right. Um, there's Hackmaster Pepper. Where does Fabula Ultima go? Ooh, good question. Where does Fabula Ultima go? That is a good question. All right, let's put Fabula Ultima down. There's Fabula. Looking fabulous. Fabula Ultima is very fun. And it is more interesting to me than 5th edition D&D. I think Fabula Ultima is probably a little less interesting to me, a little less in-depth than 3rd edition. But I also think Fabula Ultima is very, very not that complicated. Um, and so Fabula Ultima, I think actually kind of goes somewhere there in the sense that you have a very fun game, um, that actually has a surprisingly large amount of depth, but it's really not that complicated. So, you know, it's definitely smaller than third edition and fourth and, and, and third edition and fourth edition is fat. I think Fabula Ultima is a little bit simpler than fifth edition. Um, and, but I, I think it's probably about as. It's probably about as complex as, as BX, maybe a little bit more complex than BX. So maybe we'll make it a little bit bigger, but it's still smaller than fifth edition. But again, I do think the game is, is very fun. Um, and I, I, I have a lot of fun with Fab Ultima and I do think it has a lot. And again, the, the best part about it is it, there's not a lot, you know, this is high fun, reasonable interest and relatively low complexity. So, I mean, I think that's, that's definitely a win, I think. Um, and again, this is a game that I, have given, uh, you know, an A to, because I do think this game, you know, listen, there's not all that games stand out. Now, let me be clear about something here though. Let me be clear about something. If your enjoyment of games comes from their, how deep they are and how 
how, how much gameplay mechanics there are, then these games, despite being far more complicated and complex, are still going to appeal to you more. Because even though this game has a great ratio, okay, it doesn't get the job done. So like a good example of this, all right, would be like, imagine that you find a house, all right? And the house is $100,000 and you're paying, and it's, and it's, and it's a great, you know, it's a, a incredible deal. All right. It's a, it's a, and it's a, you know, it's a thousand square feet. And you're like, this, this is a great deal. I, I, I am paying a hundred dollars a square foot. That's fantastic. That's the price per square foot. So then there's another house that's 300,000 and it's 2000 square feet. And now you're paying $150 per square foot. This is the better deal. But if you have a family of whatever, three, you know, if there's four, you and three kids or you and your wife and, you know, you and your husband and two kids, and you're like, I, we, can't, we, we could not live in a thousand square foot house. I need at least 1,800 square feet or 1,900 square feet. Then even though this is the worst deal in terms of its price per square foot, this other house may as well not even exist for you because it, it just doesn't meet your needs, right? So uh, GM Scott says a thousand square feet is a cage. Um, I think my condo that I live in is a little over a thousand square feet, but I don't have kids, you know, it's, it's just, you know, it's me. So, um, and, uh, you know, and I, and I, and occasionally I live here with whoever I'm dating. Um, but my point is, is like, it's the same thing with Fabula Ultima. Yes, I think Fabula Ultima is a very elegantly designed game. I think it achieves a high level of fun. I think it achieves a modest level of interest and depth, and it does so for a fairly low uh, cost of complexity. But for some people, not it, it, it isn't deep enough, and they would get bored with it after a while. Um. So yeah, I think that's that's definitely one of them. Did I miss anybody else here? Um, you know, I haven't played Call of Cthulhu 7th Edition enough, uh, which is to say pretty much at all, to really put that on there. I would, be, I would hesitate to put that on there for sure. Um, <laughs> I don't know, Commando says, I don't think anybody plays 5e by all the rules. Um, KC says, yeah, low prep has become increasingly important for games. I was to GM as I get older, prepping for hours for each session sounds so unappealing to me now, unappealing and also potentially just not even a possibility. Um, we just, you know, you, you may not even have the time to get the proper session down, you know, uh, you want to, but you can't, um, let's see here. What would be the best game? Asks Jose. What would be the best game to transition from complex to fun? I'd like for my players to try a more loose and RP heavy game coming from 5e Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Jose, I, I suggest two games, Fabula Ultima and Dragon Bane. Um, I, I, I really speak highly. I, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, I really do speak highly of the praise of, of Dragon Bane here. Um, it, it really is a, uh, surprisingly strong game. It has, it is not as, I think it is even less complex <laughs> than Fabula Ultima. Um, and I think it is probably about as fun. In fact, it may be more fun than BX d d because of a couple of things that they did to it. And I think, you know, it's probably about exactly, it's, it's almost, maybe it's a smidge bigger than, it, it's about the same size, but I, I really do think Dragon Bane is kind of an evolution of 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 BXD and D, so I really think that you know either of these games would be really really good um, in terms of RP heavy game. You you, you can't go wrong with Fabula Ultima. Role playing mechanics are built into the DNA of the game, so for sure. Um, all RPGs ranked on the fun interesting axis. Um. Uh, I'm thinking of just a little over 1.2 K and yeah, it's tight. The cost of staying in the city. Yeah, it for sure is. 
Uh, Mind Blown says, what about Monster of the Week? Well, that's a great example. We don't have any PBTA games on here. So let's throw... I'm going to throw Apocalypse World on there just because I'm more familiar with Apocalypse World than I am with Monster of the Week. Um, so here's the thing. This may surprise people, okay? Is, is... I actually did a horrible job cropping that. Hold on a sec here. There we go. Okay. Um... Is Apocalypse World as complex as third edition D&D? No, it is less complex than third edition D&D. There's, you know, the less rules, less things to do. But is Apocalypse World, you know, a lot of people have this mistake of believing that Apocalypse World is, is rules light. It is not, okay? I think, I think Apocalypse World is more complex than Dragonbane. I think Apocalypse World is probably on the complexity level of Fabula Ultima, maybe even a little bit more complex. I think that uh, PBTA games are more complex than people that haven't really played them much give them credit for. So I do think that these games are do ask a little bit, a lot. And, and also, I, I will say, there's very, usually some of these games, you know, you can take stuff that people knew from other games. I mean, this isn't really fair, but look, it's the real world. The fact is, is if you're trying to tell somebody how to play fourth edition D&D and they've played third edition D&D or fifth edition D&D, a lot of information is going to carry over. Apocalypse World is like learning a whole new language before you can even start your job. So it, it could be really, really tough transition. That being said, I do think there's more to do in Apocalypse World than Dragonbane, less than Fabula Ultima, and I don't know. Maybe like there is where I would put Apocalypse World. Um, and 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 by that I mean just general, uh, you know, most. And I will I'll, I'll use that to say all of the old school Apocalypse World games: Apocalypse World, Dungeon World, Monster of the Week, The Sprawl, Monster Hearts, etc., etc., etc. The newer games, the Magpie games. Uh, the Avatar Legends, the Roots, the Masks, the Cartels, the Pasiones de las Pasiones. Uh, that's kind of a different. That's like the that's like the Magpie. That's like that's like PBTA 2.0 or 3.0 or something. Um, can a game like Cinnabar be somehow negative fun and the highest complexity? Yeah, I mean, we assumed that we were only talking about positive complexity here, but yes, uh, and positive fun. Uh, Chart suggestion, scum and villainy. Ooh, blades in the dark. Um, okay. Yeah. It's a great question. Blades in the dark. Do I think blades in the dark is more or less complicated than powered by the apocalypse games? Now, I mean, this is a tough question. I mean, it's obviously personal, but I'm curious. Uh, what do you think is more complicated, complex? Is it PBTA or is it Forge in the Dark? Um, because my instinct is to say that Blades in the Dark is more complicated because of position and effect. Um, so that is where my instinct is to say. Um, and the, uh, I, while I think that that could be a great tool, I also see that a lot of people struggle with it. Um, and yeah, now again, I, I did say we were exempting avatar and yes, KC says P, P and E. Yes. Um, and there's the sub phases. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say, okay. Forge in the dark is very clearly winning. Um, so I'm going to say that forge in the dark games are more complex and actually, I actually feel fairly confident in saying that I think Blaze in the Dark is more complicated than 5th edition D&D. I really do. Um, so I'm going to shrink this Apocalypse World one a little bit. Make that one a little bit more appropriate sized. And I think Blaze in the Dark is more complicated than Fabula, more complicated than Apocalypse World, more complicated than the early D&Ds, more complicated than Dragon Bane. It is just a probably a little bit less complicated than third edition. Now, that being said, where do I put it? 
uh, boy, do I think Blades in the Dark is more fun than third edition? I do. Do I think it's as interesting as fourth edition? No. I think Blades in the Dark goes like here for me. I think Blades in the Dark is a little less fun than Fabula Ultima. Okay. But I do think it's a lot more interesting, but it's a little less fun. Um, because there's just more, you know, fiddliness to it and it doesn't have quite the same, uh, you know, let's fucking go type aspect to it. So yeah, I think, I think Blades in the Dark probably goes right about there. But again, I think, you know, Blades in the Dark and Apocalypse World both, I mean, again, they are definitely not rules light. They are rules medium. Now, what is different between, let's be very clear about this. Blades in the Dark on our chart here may look about the same size as third edition D&D, and it may look about the same size as fourth edition D&D. It's a little bit less. But remember, this concept of complexity really has two different values to it, right? Oh, anonymous said uh, tip $5. Anonymous tip $5, tossing some change in the indie-ish bucket. Is that not why we're here, traveler? <laughs> um, thank you, Anonymous. Uh, go ahead and claim it if you, if you forgot to uh, put your name in the stream elements. Uh, thank you for the tip. Number one, Indie Bucket. It is why we're here. That is totally true. Uh, and we will do Traveler next. So thank you for that uh, tip and thank you for supporting the channel. Um, so remember that there is this idea of complexity and complication. Complexity is the mechanics and the, and the depth of the mechanics. Complication is all the extra shit. Third edition D and D and fourth edition D and D actually have fairly simple mechanics. D twenty roll high. There's not a whole lot there, but there's a lot of complication. There's a lot of feats, and there's a lot of little you know uh, modifiers, and there's a lot of spells. And the Blades in the Dark is actually the complete opposite. Even though they're about the same size, Blades in the Dark doesn't ask you to memorize hundreds and hundreds of feats. I mean, each playbook only has like six or seven abilities. So, and the, and there's what? 12 actions in the whole game. And there, you know, and there's no like detailed list. This is what athletics can do. This is what stealth can do. This is what, and you need to learn all these different rules for each. No, it doesn't have all that. But the mechanics themselves are very complex. And so it can create these extremely interesting and emergent gameplay loops that are really surprising without feeling like you need to like memorize a, a textbook full of feats in order to make something work. So that is, I think, an important uh, sort of distinction to make between these. Um, I mean, uh, one of the reasons that I struggle with Blaze and the uh, Powered by the Apocalypse is they, it, it, especially like Dungeon World. Dungeon World handles helping and group checks horribly. In fact, Dungeon, most PBTA games fall apart if you make a group check. Just fall apart, just straight fall apart. Uh, Blades in the Dark, Forge in the Dark games have the best group check rules like of any game ever. <laughs> um. I mean, yes. I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, taking a consequence or anything like that, but you know. Um, all right, let me get Traveler on there first. Um, Irvatillon. Ir, Irv, I was going to call you Evilton, but it's not. Irvilton. I'm assuming that we're going to talk about Traveler 2nd Edition Mongoose. All right, here's Traveler 2nd Edition Mongoose. I actually think Traveler is less complex than Hackmaster. So that is the case. Is Traveler more complex or less complex than these games? Uh, it's kind of more complex. I mean, it doesn't have all the endless feats, but man, there's a lot of ships and rules and how far away are you from the star? And that's how much radiation you take. And what's the fuel capacity on your jump drive? And I mean, there's a lot of 
of of complexity and com- you know in this game and complexity is it as is it as much as hackmaster no i don't think so um i'm gonna say now this is me this is my personal bias i'm going to say traveler is lower on the fun but uh higher on the interest you know I agree, that, I agree, Nutromancer, that the characters themselves aren't too complex, but the rules and the simulationism of it is. I mean, that, you know, and oftentimes, by the way, when the characters aren't complex, it's because the game isn't really super complicated. Like, it doesn't have, like, endless feats, and, like, I have 27 abilities written on my character sheets, um, but it does have a lot of mechanics and, you know, a lot of other stuff, you know? Yeah, so I, I think I think we're I think we're agreed. I think we're saying the same language here. Um, but I liked Traveler. You know, and again, you know, uh, we talked about this a little bit, but like, you know, I think in general, I've been sort of more drawn, you know, to this, this sort of middle section um, uh, as time has gone on. I think if anything, I will admit that it has shifted up. I have started to prioritize fun over interesting. Um, and you know, maybe even to the point where I'm willing to sacrifice some interest for fun, you know? And so I've kind of, I've kind of, I've kind of moved, um, you know, uh, up into the left. So I've kind of moved away from interest and towards fun. So I may have once been more here in the middle and I think I have actually, you know, gone shifted up to here. And as I draw this, I'm kind of like, yeah kind of looks right that does kind of look right like traveler is just in the you know just in there and i would play it and i it is a game that i think i was really interested into it same thing with fourth edition a game i love but i mean we just voted and i kind of voted against it and the reason is is because i think both of these games are a little too complicated for what i want to do and interest and the depth and the complexity and solving isn't as much as what i'm interested in now is as having fun and and just feeling, having emotions and having an emotional response to my game as opposed to an intellectual response to my game. And so, you know, yeah. I mean, and I look at this list and I go, Blaze in the Dark, Fabula Ultima, Dragon Bane, Apocalypse World, maybe even fifth edition again. Like I could see that happening. Um, man. Uh, yeah, we dropped a couple. We dropped some frames. Again, I... I doesn't look like it's anything on my end, so because I have here, you can actually see this here. This is my, this is my, this is my OBS stats. So, this is my, the 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 number on the bottom right hand corner is uh, the, on the right hand side. Frames missed due to rendering lag and skip frames due to encoding lag. That's like on my end, right? Like that's me, uh, my computer processing this video image and creating an encoder and sending it out. It, none of that has been skipped, um, but drop frames because of the network. That's that's what we're getting. So, uh, you know, whatever. Do I have a VPN on? No. Although honestly, Beowulf, I should probably try to change to 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 try switching my VPN on and actually maybe try going through a different gateway, um, like on the other side of the country or something. I don't know. Um, if you're a network engineer and you want to help me, leave a comment below or ping me on the Patreon. Uh, ping, 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 ping me on the uh, the Discord for su- suggestions. Um, ooh, well, yeah, a Weird Wizard. Uh, if you were a Kickstarter for Weird Wizard, Shadow of the Weird Wizard, which I was, um, the they came out today or yesterday or something like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think Traveler uh, was really good. Uh, so, anyways, Irvatellen said, "Been watching this for a while. Where would my thoughts for Thirteenth Age be?" Great question. Great question. 13th Age is a lot of fun. 13th Age has to be compared to 4th Edition because it's very similar to that. 13th Age is not as complex as 4th Edition. All right? 13th Age is not as complex as 4th Edition, which is why it's smaller. But it's also not quite as interesting, and it's a little bit more fun. (laughs) So... (laughs) 13th age is for e light as GM Scott says, um, you know, you, you, this is like a linear relationship. You shrink the complexity of the game, which makes it maybe not as deep, 
but it also makes it a little bit more fun. And so these two games are very close in their sort of space uh, that they occupy, in my personal opinion. Anyways, uh, so yeah, that that was the stream. Uh, you, you know, I don't see any storyteller systems on there. How about Vampire the Masquerade? So for uh, Ford, I have not played a ton of World of Darkness games. Um, I've played a little bit of Vampire. I've never GM'd a storyteller system game. So you tell me. <laughs> um, you know, what I remember and what I know of Vampire the Masquerade was that um, it felt like a fairly simple system, dice pool system, and it felt like most of the mechanics were based around that. Um, it did feel like, you know, you had a number of, you know, obfuscate and celerity and potence and presence. And I don't remember all of the vampire powers, but I remember some of them. Um, Auspex or something. So I do think it's probably, you know, in terms of rules complexity now, I don't remember how much else is there. But, like, do I think Vampire the Masquerade is, it's probably on, like, the level of, of Power by the Apocalypse, right? I would assume so. Um, Beowulf is saying, less complex than 5e, less fun, and less interesting. Beowulf is saying it's over here. Um, I don't know. Uh, where's my interest? Yeah, I would say, what's more interesting to me? Um... I don't think there's much game to the Vampire of the Masquerade game, you know, that, that that's my kind of real take on it, you know? So I, I think that like, when I think about how gamey it is, how interesting am I in engaging the mechanics? It's pretty dang low. I got to imagine the interests. First edition AD&D. Because you get to be a cool vampire and you get to move super fast and control people's minds and something like, maybe something like that somewhere in there. Does that seem reasonable? Also, and this is not a knock against older games, okay? It's not a knock against older games. But look, you know, right? In 19-whatever, 10, White Wright Brothers and Kitty Hawk, right, invented flying. Well, you know what? We, those planes, we wouldn't fly in those planes anymore, okay? We, we got better. We got better at learning how to build planes. And then we built jet engines and all this other stuff and safeties, uh, safety <laughs> safety uh, equipment and seatbelts and stuff like that. My point is, is like some of these games are just older and they, you know, uh, they, they, the tech wasn't as good, you know, uh, as it was. So it's not their fault. I mean, we're, they're being compared to modern games that have had 20 or 30 or 40 years of game design to improve, you know? And I think that that is something we have to take in, you know, take in mind. Uh, I really want to try 13th age. You should, I think it's a really fantastic game. It's a lot of fun and it's a great way to move people like um, that have been playing a lot of fifth edition or pathfinder and still keep the game gamey and still keep it, you know, fun and still keep it, you know, whatever D20 like, but introduce some new elements, some more narrative, some more what we call true role-playing elements. Um, yes, if there was an edginess access, we'd have to add a third dimension for the edginess access, then Vampire would go off off the edge. Um, burning Wheel. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. It's a great question. How complex is the wheel that burns? Burning wheel is complex. It is not necessarily complicated. The actual core mechanic of burning wheel is actually fairly simple, but there is Artha and there is shading and there is, you know, I am gray, gray two and black three. And then there's dual of wits and there's range and cover and there's, it's a complex game. There's a lot of stuff going on. It It's honestly probably like on the hack master scale of things. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to put burning wheel. Uh, I'm going to put burning wheel. Maybe like here, <laughs> something like that. 
Burning Wheel is is it's very much in the Hackmaster school of thought for me. They're ve- these two games are doing very different things, by the way. Hackmaster and Burning Wheel, they are doing very different things, but they both ask the same thing. And I, and I think I stand, I think I'm actually pretty clear in saying that Burning Wheel does not care if you're having fun. And I would say that Luke Crane doesn't care if you're having fun. That's not what his game is about. His game is about creating a very interesting experience and creating mechanics that lead to those interesting mechanic, mechanical outcomes. And the price that you pay for that is a fairly in-depth mechanical system. Oh yes, we did. We do have a third axis. The complexity. How could I forget the size of the of the size of the icon is how a thing. And by the way, generally speaking, I mean, I, I actually just wasn't really planning on this. Remember, as I said, the price you pay for making your game more interesting and more complex is, or sorry, the more interesting and more in depth is, it increases in its complexity and its complication. And you can see that by and large. As you move from left to right, uh, the pictures get bigger uh, because in order to be this in-depth, you had to pay the price. Now, there are some games that I'd like to point out that stand out. You know, like 13th Age is a pretty good size for where it is on the depth chart. I think Fabula Ultima is a pretty good, it's pretty small for where it is on the depth chart. Vampire the Masquerade is a little big for where it is on the depth chart. So, you know, Vampire the Masquerade may be saying, eh, you're, maybe the juice isn't worth the squeeze. But 13th Age and Fabula Ultima are kind of standing out and saying, maybe these games are very elegant. Maybe these games have been able to create a level of depth without a subsequent level of interest. But if you want interest and depth and this scale over here, boy, then you are going to have to pay, you're going to have to pay the price. Uh, and the price is going to be complexity and complication. Um, 13th Age is the 5e that I think the average player wishes 5e was. I think so too. I think I think there is a great shame that has happened in the role-playing game industry because of, and it's not even 5th edition's fault. It's just the way, you know, sometimes things happen and it's just the way the world comes together. But I feel like there have been so many people who should have either been playing much more complex games, deeper games, or people should have been playing much more lightweight games. Like they just got stuck in 5e and they have been churning for a decade or five years trying to figure out how to make this system do something that they 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 intuitively know that they want it to do and it, and they find themselves, you know, trapped. Um and I think that that's unfortunate. Now, there are there's a ton of people for whom 5e is like the perfect balance. But I'm just saying that there's a ton of people who I feel like got got trapped in the 5e mindset because of market factors and you know, availability and all sorts of other factors as well. Um, we could call the ratio of complexity to interesting uh, interestingness the, in, the interest efficiency factor. Yeah, I mean, there's something to be said about that. Um, and again, I mean, you know, this comes down to the elegance of game design, uh, as we said before, you know, um, go watch, I don't have a link for it, but go watch the GDC, that's the game developer conference, go, go Google or you on YouTube, uh, GDC Marvel snap and watch the guys who built Marvel snap talk about complexity in their games versus uh you know how fun and how basically how much how much are they how much cost of, of complexity are they willing to pay for a certain level of fun in their game they, they basically want to go just as far as they need to go and then not a not a bit further so they want to they want their game to be just as complex as it needs to be and not any more complex um so yeah well, uh, there we go. We we did some uh, we did some uh, systems. Uh, you know, get is, is this helpful? Is this going to help you run a better game? No, this is a, this is a uh, esoteric, pedantic exercise in you know creating uh, arbitrary standards and scales. Why do we do this? Um, because I think it's just 
it's good to think about the games that you're playing and it's good to think about why some stuff works for you and why other stuff doesn't and really consider that and realize that you don't have to accept things the way they are. You can change the game that you're playing. You could go to a new system. You could potentially alter or change the system that you are currently playing to better fit your needs. Um, and so, you know, I think that that is important to do now commando asking the real question, the most important, one. is there any game that would go in the top right corner? Well, as we said before, commando, this is the unicorn space. I cannot think of one. A game that is extremely interesting, but very fun. Now, Commando, I'm not going to lie. Uh, my hope is that Forbidden Lands, uh, it, it's not going to be up in the upper right-hand corner, but I'm hoping... Uh, I'm hoping that Forbidden Lands ends up somewhere like like around here, maybe in this region here. But is there a game that can be fun, like really fun, like woohoo, like emotional and intellectually fun? It's pretty tough. Um None that I know of. Well, I'll put it that way. Top left would be everyone is John. Yeah, that's that's probably a fair that's probably a fair assessment as well. Uh, Ford says Pendragon. Uh, no, I don't think Pendragon is really particularly interested in being fun. That's my personal opinion. I think Pendragon is more it, it, Pendragon is like he's saying Pendragon is super interesting and super fun. I mean, that's great, but don't confuse fun with enjoying it. Are you, is it, is Pendragon super interesting and that's why you're enjoying it? Um, and I think KC is right. You know, if you remember what I was talking about here, when Vin chatted about house ruling to get to unicorn step, and I talked about how, the only way that I thought you could get to the unicorn category of, you know, high complexity, high fun was by making a series of micro adjustments to take you into that place as it is custom tailored to your group. And so it's possible that there does not, this area just can't exist off the shelf. Um, I will say. There may be one, but for me, Okay, but it is very niche and it is very uh, hyper specific. Can anyone guess what I'm about to copy paste into the chat or into the chart? So there's a game I think is very niche. It's probably in the, kind of in the Pendragon, you know, uh, 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 state of things. Very niche. I think it is very fun, very exciting with lots of emotional narrative moments, but also a very deep gameplay full of a lot of mechanics. And it's not a rules like game. I would dare, I would go out to say that it is fairly crunchy. Now, Pepper says free market. Nice troll. No, uh, I'm fortune pumpkin says monster hearts. Uh, no, I don't think monster hearts is particularly a deep game in that way. Um, one ring I own, but I do not play it. So another, another vote for monster hearts. Now monster hearts is a fantastically fun game for me. No, no, no. Do you guys need more hints or does someone else going to, so again, um, I'm trying to think of a good, of a good hint that won't give it away. Um, let's put it this way. It is a game that in my opinion scores well on G and N and S and Lysander got it first and pumpkin came up with it second, but Lysander is the one who got it first legend of the five rings. Um, fifth edition for me, this game, uh, this game is like, this is, this is my, this is my, you know, heartbreaker. Um, I find this game to be very fun and very fascinating. 
Um, I find the I find the gameplay deep and in depth, and I think there's a lot of building to your characters. There's a lot of mechanics that all interact with each other to create a really compelling outcome. It does have lists of you know skills and techniques. They're called. Are there are there is there as many as in third edition? Uh, no, uh, or fourth edition? No. So I I don't think the game is the game is probably on par with fourth edition or third edition. I think it is probably a little less complex than Traveler or Burning Wheel, but it's it's by no means a light game. You know, it's a medium heavy game. But I think that the play pattern that emerges because of the game is very fun. And I think that the choices that you make and the outcomes that you make through the game are really, really good. So I would say, uh, it can, <laughs> GM Scott says, we need a fifth axis, which is the player's emotional drain capacity. In which case, GM Scott, if we could go into the fifth dimension, uh, legend, uh, how much tilt the game has is how much emotional drain capacity it takes. In which case, Legend of the Five Rings is like almost upside down. Um, you know, this this game asks a lot of you. It obviously only does one thing. That's the price you pay for being really good, in my opinion. Hyper specificity. This game does samurai drama in fantasy Rokugan. That's it. That, that is it. Um, if you try to do it for something else, you know, 80% of the mechanics are just not going to be there. Uh, that being said, the game is also... Like, I don't know what other options do I have. I don't have anything. Um, the game is also very, yeah, it's it's very it's very draining, you know. Um, and I think what can happen with Legend of the Five Rings is that it it can it can become not fun because of you know it's it's fun the way that it's fun the way that some people say haunted houses are fun. For some people, haunted houses is a lot to take. Being f frightened is fun, but for some people, it's not. And certainly after a number of very, you know, scary moments, some people are like, I'm exhausted emotionally, and this isn't fun for me anymore. Um, and I think Legend of the Five Rings can get itself into that situation as well, easily, where the game can be really, really engaging, and it's really fun because of the stakes and the emotions, right? It's an emotional game. But when that emo, remember I said fun is an emotional reaction. But when the emotional reaction that you're doing is strife and drama and tension, then that can start to affect the player as well. Now, I will say that the opposite is true, but also potentially problematic as well. When the fun that gets created from your game is only like, fuck yeah, high fives. Yeah, boy, we got it. Yeah, roll, you know, when they, when it's that kind of like party atmosphere, that's cool, right? You might say, well, isn't that better than Legend of the Five Rings? Yes, but that can lead to people not taking your game seriously. It can lead to people seeing your game as kind of a joke and and, and not, you know, and, and you start playing it more for laughs and for fun. And that's not always what we want, you know, to have either. You know, it, it's, it's not always a good thing when the game is just kind of a big joke and we're all just kind of playing around because it's all, it's a big joke. You know, we, it, it, you know, there's a, there's a line uh, from a long, like old, like a very old red letter media where he was shitting on the, um, you know, the prequels. And he, he says like, you know, or no, no, it's, I'm sorry. It's from, it's when he's shit, shitting on the sequels, he's shitting on like last Jedi. And he, I think it's, I think it's red letter media. And he says like, you know, basically, the, the game itself is making fun of people for liking Star Wars. And he's like, well, I don't know why Star Wars cast can't be serious. Yeah, it's in space. Yeah, they've got lightsabers. But that doesn't mean we can't tell real stories that have serious consequences. It doesn't have to be, you know, fart jokes. And, you know, I'm going to tell the emperor, empire that his mom is fat, you know, or something like your mama jokes, which is what they do in The Last Jedi, by the way. Um and so I do think that there is something to be said about all of that. Um, Pendragon goes exactly where Legend of the Five Rings is. Uh, remains to be seen. I think Legend of the Five Rings is actually a deeper game than Pendragon, but I'm just I'm just being I'm just being biased. But I do think it is a deeper game. Um, 
Is it the game or is it the GM? Smith said that scum and villainy was emotionally draining too. I sense a pattern. Well, okay, except scum and villainy is a blaze in the dark, is a forge in the dark game. And forge in the dark games are designed so that the players never really fully win, right? The players win, but with a compromise. The players succeed, but with a compromise. The players succeed, but with a compromise. Compromise, 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 right? So in my opinion, Forge in the Dark is designed to create these, what some people might call unsatisfying conclusions because that's what keeps the story going and that's what keeps the, uh, uh, you know, the wheels spinning. I think a lot of people want that, I won. Resolution over. I did it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. I did it. And those games, I think, are designed to sort of not allow you to do that. And that can be very draining. You know, Legend of the Five Rings is going to put, you know, the player in a situation where it's like, okay, you either can disobey your Lord's order, which of course will ruin your honor, or you could follow your Lord's command and commit this dishonorable act, which will also lower your honor. Um, that's a reasonable situation for samurai drama. Is that draining? Yeah, it can be, especially after a while. Um, you're going to challenge me to a duel. Listen, all right. Imagine Pendragon is up there, but I added Legend of the Five Rings after it, and it's exactly covering where Pendragon is. You know, <laughs> would that make you feel better? Here, uh, here, just, 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 to, just to get, just to get Beowulf's goat. All right. We got Pendragon. It's right there. And there. It's it's right behind it. Um Right, exactly, Gid. You know, it, you know, if you go into playing Call of Cthulhu and you you think you want to win the game and beat the game, uh you're in for a uh you're in for a a rude awakening, you know. So, um, all right, well, it's almost 10 o'clock. This stream went a lot longer than I expected. And, uh, I, I didn't think we were going to get any tips or any, uh, uh, stream, uh, super chats. So again, um, if you have any ideas, I mean, again, it could just be YouTube servers. Maybe I do need to try going onto, uh, my Nord VPN and shifting over to something in, I don't know, maybe a different part of the country it might it seems like it wouldn't make sense that a, a vpn would improve my speed but if the problem is like a local youtube server server in my area or my region it could be um anyways so before i go again let me say thanks to everybody who came out and supported me tonight um you guys are uh awesome we had uh, some anonymous tips. We had pepper self-confessed cynic zadarock gm scott jmh tsl frontman Squirrel Hermit, London, Chase. Um, so we had a bunch of people. GM Rufus hit us with his 12 months of Adventurer resub, which is great. Damien with 22 months, coming up on two years of his uh, support of the Adventurer channel. Chris White with his second month. So thanks, everybody, for doing that. And of course, thank you to our patrons. Um, you know, these, uh, you know, we're not a, the biggest Discord uh, server in the world, um, but... Does it tell you the time of those drop frames? Is there a regular interval? I don't know. I'd have to, I don't think so. I don't think it does give me like a thing. Hello. Cole Grandel tipped $5. Thanks for making a great and challenging stream, Derek. <laughs> well, thank you, Cole. I appreciate your support. Uh, due to the support of people like Cole and all everybody else I just listed, um, you know, and as well as all of our incredible patrons, who support us each and every single month, which is a huge ask. Um, uh, we can do these streams because you know this is this is going to get this is going to get two thousand views on YouTube. Okay, this is going to get three thousand, you know, two thousand five hundred views on YouTube after a month. You know what does that mean? It means you know eight bucks. You know it's it's, it's nothing. So I mean, like just the tips alone from this stream are ten times what YouTube is willing to give me and. When, what YouTube is willing to give me is an indication of what the wider population wants. 
you know? Ayo. Raptor. Raptor tipped $7. Hey, Derek, can I check the sarcophagus again? <laughs> GM Scott with $3. GM Scott tipped $3. How about a HTS for the road? Uh, we'll we'll do that. Raptor, I, uh, Raptor, are you Bob? What is going on? <laughs> I don't know who Raptor is. Um, unless they meant to be putting Rob Tier, which is Bob's character's name from Forbidden Lands. Bob plays a hunter, and they went into this tomb, and they were trying to get this um, uh, magical bow. Okay, not all right, not Bob. <laughs> you just put Raptor. It's Rob Tier. <laughs> All right. Thank you, George. Anyways, so they have this stone sarcophagus. They go into this tomb, and there's supposed to be a legendary magical bow buried with this ancient um, horse lord king. And they get in there. Of course, the horse lord king has been – they knew he had been cursed uh, to be, you know, to to due to his um, dalliances with demons. And he arose as a, as a death knight, and, you know, he battled them. And the group got lucky, and, and the group – uh, had some fun roles and they beat him. And so Bob's at this point is like a, a bottle of wine deep into the night. And he's like, I look in the sarcophagus, you know, that he came out of. And I was like, okay, there's a pile of smattering of silver coins and some old, uh, you know, completely uh, decayed funerary garbs and shrouds and maybe some, you know, other organic material, which is otherwise completely disintegrated over the many, you know, hundreds of years. And he's like, okay, but where's the bow? And I go, there, there's no bow in, in the sarcophagus, Bob. And he goes, oh, okay. Okay. So, all right. Well, all right. I'm going to look in, I'm going to look in, I'm going to move the, I'm going to take the lid off and look in the sarcophagus though. Go. And I go, no, no, Bob, the sarcophagus got broken apart. And the, the, the guy came leaping out. You're looking into the coffin, Bob. It's just, it's empty other than the silver coins. And Bob's like, oh, okay. And then, like, other people were asking questions about these alcoves around the edge of the room. And then Bob goes, but what about the sarcophagus? Like, is there anything in the sarcophagus now? Like, like they looked at the alcoves. Is there a bow in there? Like, he just kept, he could not process that the, the magic bow that his character wanted wasn't just laying in the sarcophagus. It was pretty funny. Uh, GM Scott asked for a HTS to go, and we will definitely deliver. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out with me tonight. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next time. I don't know what our topic is going to be. The patrons will help figure that out. Um, just a huge, huge thank you to all of our patrons, especially our heroes, our exalteds, and our legends. Um, our squires, knights, and champions are, you know, obviously uh, the, the backbone of this uh, community. Uh, they are the ones who are playing and filling up our community games. They are the ones keeping the, you know, the, the streams and the GMs and things running. But our heroes, exalteds, and legends, uh, you know, they really uh, contribute a large amount of money each month we try to make sure that we give them options for fun merch and exclusive events and as many benefits as perks as we can. But the fact of the matter, the truth of the matter is, um, you know, they are giving us more than we are giving them. And uh, we are very, very thankful and appreciative to them. So thanks and shout out to all of our, uh, all of our patrons, but, uh, but to those legends, especially. All right. Or GM Scott, a legend himself. Hora. Right.